Welcome, 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 ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Faith Unaltered. We have an exciting episode for you all planned this evening. We have Father Jonathan Ivanoff and Pastor Samuel Farag with us to discuss icons. Are these holy images to be used in worship or are they idolatrous? Gentlemen, welcome to the show. We'll start with David. Go around, introduce everybody. And then uh, Father Jonathan and Pastor Samuel, uh, we'll get you guys, since you, neither one of you have been on uh, Faith and Altered before, we'll give uh, get you to give a little background information about yourself and uh, introduce yourself to the audience. But David, brother, we've already done a show today, uh, a really fun show with uh, Ben Witherington and uh, Larry about uh, the Shroud of Torin. But brother, how have you been? How's your weekend going so far? Oh, man, this weekend's been pretty relaxing so far. I haven't had to go and bottle any wine. <laughs> so I've been uh, just chilling out, took a nap today even. So I feel pretty good. I feel pretty good. It's been a good week. Uh, glad to see Dale here and Josh. Um, yep. It's always good to see see those guys. And it's going to be an interesting conversation that I'm really looking forward to. I'm on Team Sam, so um hate to tell you all, but I'm rooting for him. <laughs> I think it's a pretty even split. So now that Davidson's here, so yeah. we've got a we got a pretty even split. But Dale, brother, how have you been uh, doing uh, this week? How's your weekend going so far? And uh, yeah, yeah, I've been good. Um, so this week again is another busy week with four podcasts for me. Um, so this is the third one now. But uh, yeah, earlier today I was on with Tyler and David, and we we're doing the Shroud of Trin with. Um, Dr. Ben Witherington, uh, the biblical scholar, and Larry Stolle to talk about are, are there uh, texts in the New Testament that actually speak about the Shroud of Turin or not? So, yeah, we were doing a bit of a discussion on that topic there. So, yeah, there is one for sure that talks about the burial cloth. And then uh, Larry went on to discuss some other texts that maybe of a more cryptic nature uh, that allude to the Shroud of Turin. But yeah, uh, Great, great discussion. Check that out if you uh, have not seen that yet. Joshua Davidson, my brother from another mother. How are you doing, sir? It's good to have you back with us. Man, I'm glad to be here. I uh, I literally just got into the house. Thankfully, my lovely wife uh, preemptively set up all my stuff for me and oh. had my, my, my mic and camera already on and ready and in position and stuff. So uh, it's so uh, gave you time to take the overalls off, huh? I did have enough time to take the overalls off. I can put them back on if you want, but you know, just trying to, trying to, kind of you know, take take the take the farmer brown down. But uh, I, I, I'm happy to be here. I'm excited for this. this is going to be, I hopefully, a very copacetic and good conversation, something worth having. Uh, but this is definitely a topic that's been, uh, let's say, important and increasingly so for me over the last couple of years. Uh, yeah. discovering the nature of Christian symbolism and mysticism and and diving into a more participatory uh, kind of theology and uh, just recognizing the the rich artistic tradition that I've always been enamored with as somebody who draws and and things like that. But now there's almost another reason for it to become part of my worldview rather than just part of my skill set or hobbies. Uh, it mm -hmm. seems to have this larger, expansive kind of uh, piece to it as well. And I'm, I'm always, I'm always trying to push my, the boundaries of my ignorance to find out more. And this is going to be one of those times where I feel like my fences are going to get smacked down. So I'm ready. Right on, right on. Well, let's introduce the guy that maybe be smacking them down for you tonight. Father Jonathan Ivanoff, sir, it is an honor. It is a pleasure to have you on the podcast with us for our listeners that don't know you, please go ahead and introduce yourself to them. Well, I've been an Orthodox priest for, uh, as of this month, as of next week, 30 years. Congrats. Uh, all of that time spent at a parish on Long Island uh, called St. John the Theologian, often popularly referred to in Western Christianity as St. John the Divine or St. John the Evangelist. <clears throat> and um, I am um, um, never ceasing to be amazed at how the pastoral work of a parish priest plays out, um, especially uh, in the last two months or so where the Orthodox Church has gone through Lent and, and then last week, Holy Week, and last Sunday, uh, mm -hmm. the celebration of our Lord's resurrection. Uh, the thing that uh, St. Paul once reminded us, if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, then uh, my preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. So the centerpiece of the 
of the Christian world is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we just celebrated that. So I greet all uh, with the Paschal greeting, Christ is risen. And um, uh, with the joy of this period, um, I look forward to our uh, some, some real fellowship tonight, actually, um, and an opportunity not to debate so much as to discuss and see if we can arrive at some common mind. Amen. He's risen indeed. Truly, he is risen. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you for that, uh, Father Jonathan. Pastor Samuel, for those who don't know you, sir, go ahead and introduce yourself, and then I will go ahead and lay out kind of the format of the discussion. Uh, but go ahead, uh, Sam, the floor is yours. So I'm a missionary uh, with Village Missions, um, was in Texas, been a pastor for four years, um, and they sent us over to Western New York. So I'm serving um, here in Bethel Baptist Church in Gorham, New York. Um, and I also have a website, um, Exposing the Word Ministries, and that just captures uh, the sermons, articles I've written. Um, I come from an Orthodox background. I grew up in the Coptic Orthodox Church, so Oriental Orthodox, uh, but a lot of similarities with Eastern Orthodox. Um, and honestly, the reason I um, became a missionary was because uh, growing up, I uh, didn't hear um, at least the gospel that I would say is the gospel message from Scripture. Um, so wanting to share that with others. Um, especially in the Northeast where that's, um, there's a struggle with that. So um, that's what, what I've been doing, doing a lot of work with um, what Eastern Orthodoxy and Oriental Orthodox uh, teaches um, so I can share, here's what they're teaching. Because I want to be faithful in that too. I don't want to strong yeah. man or misrepresent what they teach, simply present here's what they teach. And then here's what I see what scripture says. And then let's, let's have a discussion. So uh, really looking forward to discussion here today. Right on. I think that's one of the more, most important things. If you're into apologetics, right? Know the other side. Know the other side. Don't just lean on what somebody else tells you about it. Do the research, you know, and and really figure it out. Because uh, no one, no one. I don't want to misrepresent anybody, and I don't want anybody misrepresenting me. So, so thank you for that, uh, Pastor Sam. All right, ladies and gents. So before we dive into this, so this is not going to be your typical debate. I talked with both uh, Father Jonathan. We had a good meeting, uh, and with Pastor Sam. Uh, about what was it, guys? A little over a couple months ago, it was over a month ago. Uh, yeah. but right before we started this and and to discuss how do we want to do this, you know, get get the details laid out. And so what was agreed upon was having a list of questions set ready to go, and then some interchange back and forth between the questions. So what we're going to do is I'm going to just no opening statements, nothing like that. Uh, where I'm going to ask a question. Uh, specifically, the first one is to Father Jonathan. Uh, Father Jonathan will give his answer to that question. I'll ask Sam if he's got any follow-up. Hopefully, by then, the two will be engaging with each other um, on, on the topic, and then we'll just move on uh, through the questions like that. We will be having a Q&A session, so audience Q&A. So if you would like to ask... Or, whoa, man, my country voice came out there. If you would like to ask... Uh, these guys a question please do so do so do so uh, this is what we're here for to to dive into this topic and to express you know what exactly it is uh, we all believe about the icons uh, are they to be used in in worship or not and so get your questions asked now this is going to give me an opportunity to announce this we at faith unaltered if you're on faith unaltered you can do this but if you're watching on real seekers or csg you can't because uh, they, we don't have a thousand subscribers on Real Seekers. Dale's really close. Uh, but if you want to get your question prioritized all the way up to the top of that list, you can send us a super chat. For one, it's a great way to financially support our ministry. We rely on you guys uh, that are watching to to help us keep going. I mean, this it we we keep doing what we do because of y'all, and so we really appreciate everyone that has con, uh, contributed in the past and continues to contribute uh, to this day. So, if you would like to financially support our ministry, and if you would like to get your question to the top of that list, we'll ask it as soon as it's asked. If it's relevant to the topic, if not, we'll save it for first uh, in the Q and A period. But that's a great way to do that. You can hit the little money symbol down at the bottom of your screen and you can choose to send us a super chat or a super sticker. Uh, and that would, uh, that would be how you do that. So, uh, David, Dell or Josh, is there anything that y'all would like to, uh, before we begin, do y'all have anything that you would like to add? Um, I guess just an announcement because it's not going to be up on, um, our, it's not going to be something I'm running, but I'm going to be a guest 
on the Christian apologist S.J. Thomason's show on Wednesday, uh, the 26th, I think it is. So, yeah, um, I think that's sometime in the afternoon around 1 p.m. So, yeah, check out S.J.'s channel and you'll see me there as a guest. So. Right just don't show many cream soda from Canada. Okay? <laughs> I knew it. I knew it was coming up. Inside joke. Also, um, we do have a uh, discussion going on tomorrow at 1130 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, we're going to be discussing theodicy with Kerry Griffel. We've got Travis Worth. We've got David Russell and our good buddy Dane Von Ace uh, jumping in on that conversation. So God, the problem of evil, theodicy is the topic tomorrow at 1130 a.m. Eastern time. You can catch that right on Faith Unaltered, Real Seekers, or the Complete Center's Guide YouTube channel. So, gentlemen, without further ado, I will ask the first question. And then if we want to just go around, um, David, if you want to take the next one, uh, and then Dale, if you want to take. Josh, you got the questions pulled up? You want me to send them to you? Okay, all right. I'll send them to you while uh, while we go through the first couple, three questions here. And then if you want to take the fourth question, we'll just go around in order like that. So let's get started. So my first question for Father Jonathan. Sir, in discussions pertaining to icons, I have found that many Protestants, many Protestants, bring up the second commandment given in Exodus 20, verse 4, and attempt to argue against any form of a quote-unquote graven image. Could you elaborate a bit about how exactly you define graven image? Well, that's a very good question. It's really at the heart of this entire discussion. What does the scripture say, and are we violating it by going against what scripture says? So let's, um, let's bring up right now what Exodus 20, verse 4 says. So for everybody watching right now and listening right now, this is what Exodus 24 says. You shall not make for yourself a carved, that's the King James translation, a carved or in other translations, graven image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve, and in other translations, worship them. Now, we Orthodox completely agree with this. And to that we say, amen. Now, we also have some, some other things that have to be said in conjunction with mentioning Exodus, Exodus 24, for example, in Deuteronomy 15, take heed to yourselves for you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire. This is at the heart also of understanding why the Lord did not want the Israelites to make anything that represented him. Now, let's understand what we're talking about here when we talk about graven images. There's some definitions <clears throat> that we need to talk about. First, what is an image? What is a carved or graven image? Um, what is an idol? And then finally, what is worship that we're not supposed to give to those things that are graven images? Now, the word image in Greek is translated ikon, which is where we get the word icon from, which is what we're talking about tonight. Mm -hmm. Images are found throughout the Old Testament. In Exodus 25, 18, you have what seems to be a contradiction, and people have, have asked me this, is this a contradiction? Or in Exodus 20, the Lord is saying, don't make anything that is an image of anything that is in the earth beneath or heaven above, right? Right. Now, in Exodus 25, you have in verse 18, and you shall make two cherubim of gold of beaten work shall you make them in the two ends of the mercy seat and make one cherub at one end, the other cherub on the other end, and so forth and so on. In chapter 26, verse 1, Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen, and blue, and purple, and scarlet, with cherubim of cunning work shall you make them. So on the one hand, we have the Lord saying, don't make any images. Well, he says specifically, don't make any graven images, carved images. And then elsewhere, a few chapters later, he's saying, make images. Now, is that contradictory? No, it's not. Because there's a difference between the images the Lord is commanding the Israelites to make, which will adorn the tent of meeting, and which will therefore be used in Israelite cultic worship. Now, let's talk about what a carved image is. This is a little bit different. Creating a man made object and treating it as if it were divine 
is what we're talking about when we talk about making a carved or graven image. This is something the Lord complained to the Israelites about for the next couple hundred years. You're under every tree and on every top of every hill worshiping these idols and these things that have been set up by the nations surrounding and been influenced by them. So he was upset with the Israelites and let the kingdom of Israel fall specifically because they were bringing in and bowing down to the images of the gods of other nations. Ye shall not make idols, nor graven images, nor neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall you set up any image of stone in your land to bow down in, unto it, that's worship, for I am the Lord your God. Also Deuteronomy 4, 5, 7, 12, and especially in chapter 27 to 15, cursed be the man that make any graven or molten image, an abomination unto the Lord. Molten image would be like the golden calf they made while Moses was up on the mountain. Cursed be the man that makes any graven or molten image, an abomination to the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and putteth in a secret place. The people shall answer and say, Amen. So an image of something that actually exists, like cherubim, is going to be different from a graven image that is the conceptualization, because this is what all the other nations were doing, the conceptualization of what God is like, what he looks like. This is what all the nations were trying to do. But as we know from Deuteronomy 4, uh, especially verse 15, God is saying to them, don't make an image of me because you don't know what I look like, for you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire. So again, that's what's behind the difference between a holy image like cherubim on the tent of meeting and carved or graven images, which is involving the mind of man to make up something like the other nations do to try and speculate about what the Lord is like. He didn't want that. You haven't seen me. Don't let your puny mind go wild creatively uh, putting together something of me that bears no resemblance to what I really am. Now, if we come to understand, and I know I'm skipping through this kind of quickly, if we come to understand the difference between that, then we come down to the issue of what an idol is. Now, the Hebrew Bible has often been characterized as concerned with the problem of idolatry, and indeed the, the whole history of Israel and Judah in the Promised Land is exactly a problem with idolatry. The word idolatry, it should be noted, that term itself, when used in the Old Testament, is a term of Greek origin, uh, meaning the worship of images. And there's really no simple equivalent in biblical Hebrew. Uh, later Hebrew uses the term avodah zarah, which is often translated into English as idolatry, but the root semantics of the two are quite different. Whereas the term idolatry implies a specific concern with images, avodazara, really literally meaning strange worship, refers more generally to religious practices that are deemed wrong or foreign. Now, we, we progress then in our definitions from that to what worship really is. Understand that the word worship is an old English word that comes from really two words, worth-ship, worth-ship, giving to God that which is worth of him or worthy of him, giving to God those religious practices which are due to him in offerings and sacrifices specifically. In other words, worship in the Old Testament was something that required an offering or a sacrifice. It was not necessarily tied to bowing down, as some people talk about with regards to icons. Because we find in the Old Testament people bowing down to one another all the time. Uh, Jacob bowed down to Esau seven times when he was approaching him. Uh, the brothers of Joseph bowed down to him. Uh, but they weren't worshiping. That, that's not Worship is not about bowing down. And, and that's going to be an important term when we start to go through these definitions about what icons are, why they're kissed, why people do bow, make bows in front of them and things like that. So we come to uh, the following kind of conclusion. And again, I know I'm going through some of this rather quickly. If we are not to make anything that is in heaven above, but the Jews were instructed to do just that for the tent of meeting, 
then clearly the issue is not images at all, but their intended use. We are not to bow down to images in worship, but images can be used in worship as the tent of meeting, I think, clearly demonstrates. So I'm, with that, I'm going to, to finish that question and then uh, we'll go on to any other questions that come from. I know Pastor will respond. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, Father uh, Jonathan. Pastor Sam, you're up. Do you have any follow up uh, for that? Yeah, and I think here we, we do agree uh, a lot here. Um, it, uh, I'm not arguing that all images are bad. And yes, we see that God commands um, them to make the images in the temple and in the ark and all these other things. So we know it's really the intended use. So we agree there. Um, but I want to point out an, uh, an example in Scripture, Numbers 21, verses 8 through 9. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. And we know, so here we have God instructing it. We see Moses, the one who built it. And not just that, when you go into the New Testament, you see in John 3, verse 4 through 15, uh, what it says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, and whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So this, we also see that this thing that was created also foreshadows the crucifixion of Christ, of him being lifted up on the cross. So this is all extremely significant. But then we have to remember what it said in 2 Kings 18.4. He, and that's referring to King Hezekiah, removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asira. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. So we see here that although God commanded it, and although Moses made it, and although that it foreshadowed the crucifixion of Christ, once it was abused, then it was destroyed. And that was the honorable thing to do. And I want to pay attention here. King Hezekiah did this during a reformation. And I think this is key for us to understand that King Hezekiah was not building something new. We're not going to go ahead and say, King Hezekiah, you've now created brand new doctrine. You know, you, you, no, he, he did a reformation to go back to how things are supposed to be. That we're supposed to have our worship and veneration for God and God alone. And when it's abused, it's better to get rid of it completely. And we see that this pattern of reformation is actually seen all throughout Scripture. We, we see it with... Um, King Hezekiah, King Josiah, Ezra and Nehemiah. And we see it also with John the Baptist and Jesus. And I would argue that we see it with, with the Protestant Reformation. A lot of people argue, oh, you guys are just doing something new. But no, we're seeing things that are abuses, just like what King Hezekiah saw. These are abuses, and we're going back to how it was before. And as we're going to have this discussion and see, there is nothing in Scripture that shows that we're supposed to venerate icons. There's nothing in, in early church history that shows us that we're supposed to do these practices. So the discussion here is that if it's not commanded for us to do, in fact, I believe Scripture warns us against it. When we see abuses, we're not supposed to do that. And as a person who has not just you know been on the outside looking in, I have lived in the Orthodox Church. I, I, I 32 years of my life, I was a part of it. And I have seen people who, when they're acting and, and the way that they're treating icons, it is worship. Absolutely, it is worship when you look at it. So we're not supposed to do that because when we look at what Scripture commands us to do, when we participate in these practices, they're so dangerous. And I, I know we'll, we'll, we'll get into this. John of Damascus, he'll argue um, that, it, oh, in the Old Testament, people were prone to idolatry, but not in it, not Christians. But that's also not true because Scripture consistently warns us about that too, about avoid idolatry. So that would be my input and what I would bring um, to, to that um, point that was made. Father Jonathan. Well, again, we're not really disagreeing a lot here. Uh, pastor mm -hmm. is saying we shouldn't hold idols up as things to which we commit our worship and, and things like that. And, and we completely agree. But I think I'd like to um, throw a question back to Pastor Sam, and that is when he talks about or, or worries about um, the way in which icons can be worshipped and so forth, or people that, that do this, um, the, the first thing I want to acknowledge is that 
while pastor comes from the Coptic Orthodox background, that background is a little different than, than my background. So I want to acknowledge that for people that are not familiar with those differences. I, I'm not going to go into them here, but there are differences. Uh, and certainly how people uphold certain things that look similar, like like icons. Uh, I can't speak for how the Coptic Church teaches. I know what we teach. Well, what I would uh, ask pastor to define is what worship is and what kind of worship is offered that, that he's talking about that, that is offered to these things, to, the, to these images. Well, these images, like the icons, for example, what you're doing is you're doing actions that are meant for God alone that you're now doing to these images. So when we look at, for example, what were idols um, in, for example, look at the Greek gods. You know, they actually thought Zeus was in Olympia, not in the actual statue itself. And the argument that's that the pagans true, by the way. Made, sorry, that's not true. By the way, when when Christians started defending icons and the veneration of icons, pagans kind of chimed in at the same time, going, "Oh, well, that's what we believe. We believe that too. That you're giving that honor to the image, and it's going to the prototype." They started chiming in the same thing. They started to try and get on board to show that their idols were no really different than our icons. So it's it's not really true to say that they didn't see the God in that statue. They did. I, I, again, well, if we look at the, the discussion of origin and Celsus, um, that, that was um, very telling. Um, well, the, the, the let's be careful about quoting certain fathers. Origin has been condemned as a heretic. So we have to be very careful about what we assume to be that which we can quote from him and that which we shouldn't be quoting from him. Overall, his approach on many things was so suspect, he was condemned by an ecumenical council, his, all his writings, and he himself, by the way. So we, we better be careful about who we're quoting and what we're quoting from. Same thing with people like Tertullian, who died as a uh, separated from the church uh, as part of the Montanist heresy. I mean, we don't know when a lot of these guys started being influenced by the stuff that eventually led them away from the church. So let's just be careful about quoting people like Origen. Yeah, but it is important to look at Origen as a, as a historical witness. I'm, I'm not arguing that Origen or Tertullian or others um, are necessarily recognized as saints or church fathers, but they do serve as historical witnesses. And, and they do represent proof of what was going on during the time, especially when this debate between a pagan and an origin was revealing to what was done during that time. So the debate between origin and the pagan Celsus, again, is very revealing because it sheds light on the attitude of image veneration of that day. Uh, the pagan philosopher and the critic of Christianity made Christian rejection of images in worship a point of criticism. So he was actually making it a point of criticism that they had rejected images in their worship. And he claimed that Greek philosophers understood that the images were not the gods themselves. So this is, again, just like we can't strawman, we can't strawman the pagans here. This is Celsus, who's a pagan, speaking for what they believe. And this is what he's saying, that they, they, they understood that the gods were not in the um, idols themselves. According to Celsus, worship to the gods did not terminate on the image or the icon used in the worship, but through the images passed on to the actual god never resting on the mere medium of the icon. Again, this is the exact same argument that the Orthodox Church and the Catholics will later on use, that it, the, the icons are a window to the saints. This argument has been done for a lot longer within the pagan culture. And later on, over time, the Orthodox Church developed and took that argument and modified it to be a, a, a Christian argument. But they took a pagan argument and went with that. No, he did not. No, that that would be completely false. It's the other way around. If anything, the the Orthodox, the, the 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 if we can call it the Catholic Church, which is how it was referred to back then, the Catholic Church had a clear understanding of images from the very beginning, from very early on. This is why we see images in the catacombs. This is why we see images um, painted in the churches. And this is why some of the, the very images that we have that, that date back to the 6th or 4th century, 5th century, exist because we have been using them from the very beginning. Um, again, I would counter the claim that we took the pagan argument of the honor to the image it goes on to the prototype. They took that from us. 
because we were always saying that there's a reality to the icon that harkens to the prototype. And they, they started to say, when we gave that argument, they started to say the same thing. So I would say it's not that we copied them. We have no reason to copy them, but they were copying us because we were using those images a lot longer than they were. But, but I would argue, where's the evidence of that? Because a lot of people will quote um, Basil, who was in the fourth century, who talked uh -huh. about about that uh, the quote about the um, image going to the prototype. But he wasn't even talking about icons or liturgical worship. He was talking about the Trinity there. So, and that was in the fourth century. But when we actually look at historical data, like what happened here between Origen and Celsus, that's much older. So, if you're saying that the Christians had this argument from before, then where where is the proof? Well, here's the problem with quoting from the fathers and not understanding the context. Let's take St. Irenaeus, for example. Now, he's certainly a saint. He holds incredible weight for our faith as not only a church father, but an apostolic father. And reformed uh, critics that, that point to iconography often cite a, a passage from his book against heresies which again was not written against malpractices in the church, but against the Valentinian Gnostics and their practice of placing an image of Jesus along with the Greek Gnostic philosophers as a master Gnostic teacher in the same vein as they were. So if you can say, well, St. Irenaeus said this, but yes, the context takes that saying into an entirely different direction that is not condemning iconography, but is condemning the practice the Gnostics were doing in taking holy images and associating them with the unholy. That's what he was criticizing in the context of that particular passage. And there are other uh, kind of, uh, there are other saints that are often quoted who have often been misquoted because the context is not clearly understood. For example, there's another saint, St. Epiphanius, and Reformed critics like to tell the story supposedly reiterated by St. Jerome, where it is said that St. Epiphanius smashed an icon in a local church. Now, the account might be pretty spurious because there's no other evidence of this story actually occurring, not even from St. Epiphanius himself. And the saints often like to talk about these kind of things that they did. St. John of Damascus actually addressed this matter and said that this story was fiction. And the supposed account by St. Jerome, a forgery made up by the iconoclast to support their heresy. He even points out that the church that was built on St. Epiphanius's tomb in his honor has icons all over it. So it's quite a historical contradiction. So we can go through many of the church fathers that reformed critics often like to quote, and we've got a problem either with non- Christian influences already present before they ever left the church and became whatever they became, like Tertullian, a Montanist, and so forth, already there, which would bring into question how suspect any of their teachings are if those pres if, if that that uh, those false teachings were already present in the past. So, and, and and certainly quoting one father, two fathers, even three or four fathers isn't going to prove anything because then there's the whole plethora of fathers that say something about icons that let's say is very positive. So let's be very careful about quoting and certainly taking out of context many of the church fathers and even those that are not church fathers, but very influential like Origen and Tertullian and others, um, Eusebius of Caesarea, whoever. Uh, let's be very careful about taking quotes from them about this topic. Well, I think we do We do need to look in context. For example, when John of Damascus dismisses um, Epiphanes, um, that wasn't his attitude in the first treatise. If you read his first treatise, he says, well, maybe his, his stuff could have been fake because, you know, people could write fake things. And later on in his second or third treatise, he changes his attitude without giving the evidence of why all of a sudden Epiphanes is no longer, um, his, his work is suspect. So he changes his attitude without even revealing. And that's exactly, we do need to read the fathers in context. And I would recommend read John of Damascus, read his treatises and see how his opinion on Epiphanes changes from the first treatise to later on. The other thing that we should do is there may be some works that Epiphanes is questioned because they have different reasons to question it, but it is agreed upon an undisputed writing that he has 
when he says, when images are put up, the customs of the pagans do not rest. This is coming from a document that's undisputed from Epiphanes. He's clearly showing that his attitude is against icons and he sees the dangers of having an image would lead to pagan practices. He's calling them pagan practices. And you know but, what the context of that letter is? What's the context? Okay. The, the problem, now let's go back to John of Damascus just for a second. John of Damascus may have not given the reason why he changed his tune later on, but the fact of the matter is he is one of the definitive church fathers on iconography and iconology. So to say that there's one letter that differs from the, the second or the third or the other stuff that he wrote, which is quite substantial on iconography and iconology, really doesn't prove the point. It just points to the fact that he might have not known, looked into it, and then later corrected himself without having to explain himself. Because everything else he wrote falls into the same vein of supporting the orthodox position on icons and doesn't waver for that. And this he did at the at the risk of death in a, in a place and at a, in a time when Islam was all around him. And he could have been persecuted, excuse me, could have been persecuted for writing what he wrote, but he wrote it fearlessly and he was, and he provided a foundation for, um, uh, not a foundation for, but a strengthening of the arguments in the Orthodox Church about icons. Uh, to go back to Epiphanius, um, you know, we're talking again about one father, but let's also understand that during the time, uh, people in stunning church history think that Constantine came along and everybody then was Christian and so forth. And that's not what happened. That is not what happened. It took a long time for the empire to be Christianized. And, and um, what you have documented in some places are Christian converts from paganism putting statues and representations of their family gods or whatever in the churches. And this was one of the things that was addressed by St. Irenaeus and others in, in a different way bringing family gods and representations into the churches, not knowing what was a saint and what wasn't. You know, they, they hadn't been properly catechized probably at that point. And what's being condemned is the practice that they're bringing their images in. Not that the Orthodox images were wrong, but those images were wrong. And they had to be, they had to be put out of the churches. Hey. Can I ask a clarifying question for a second here? Um, in, in the beginning of your, your first response, uh, Samuel, you, you had mentioned uh, that there were there were particular actions or, or, or things that you could physically perform that were supposed to be reserved for God alone. Uh, and that was included in the umbrella kind of description you were giving for worship. Can you give a couple examples of those the, the physically oriented actions that would have been something that if given to. Uh, and an icon, a painting, or a you know a, a, a carving, um, that that it would be a violation, whereas it would be something that should be reserved for God. What would be what would be an example of that kind of thing? Well, for example, if we're talking about, and I know this gets into praying for to the saints, but when you're praying to an icon, um, believing that you're communicating with the saint and praying to the saint, that saint, you're giving them a God quality that they can now hear prayer. And, and again, where in scripture does it say that a person who has passed on, yes, I know that they're living in heaven, but where, where does it say that they can now hear prayer? Nowhere in scripture does it say that. That's, that's in fact only attributed to God. And now you're going up to these pictures thinking that you're doing the exact same thing of what you're doing to God, which is lifting up prayer. And yes, I know that they're asking for intercession, but it's still an act that only God can do. Only God can hear prayer. They don't have the ability to hear prayer. And, and that has never been revealed or shown or instructed for us to do in Scripture. In fact, when the disciples ask Jesus, how are we to pray? He shares exactly how to do that. And never does he say, speak to somebody else. You know, you're, you're addressing the Father, you're addressing God. But he never says, go and speak to somebody else. Yet, when we have these icons set up, people are going to it and they're praying to it as if they're uh, praying to a person. And that's, Pastor, and that's how important. do you define prayer? How do you find that the word pray? My next question. How yeah, do you define the word pray? Communicating with God. No. Let, let's understand something here before we go on. It, definitions are very important. The word pray 
is a very old English word that means to ask. That's all it means. And it was the word chosen by those who translated the scriptures into English as the word that translates the Greek the best. And it's been retained ever since. So when you say, I, I'm praying to God, you're talking about a dialogue with God. You're talking about asking God um, whatever you're asking him. But that's what the word means. That's what the English word to pray means. Shakespeare used it that way. Tell me, I pray thee, whatever. You know, he, he used the word in that context because back then, even in his time in the 1600s, that's what the word meant. And he used it in, in much of his work. So when we talk about the word, excuse me, pray, we're talking about simply asking. Nowhere in the scripture does it say that you can only pray to God. It, it encourages prayer to God, absolutely and encourages our prayer to God to be paramount and so forth. But, uh, and, and certainly it says elsewhere in the scriptures, let your requests and petitions be made known to God. Okay, we, we know this, but nowhere does it say you can't ask another person to pray for you because then we've all been doing it wrong for many centuries, going to person and say, hey, I got this operation come up. Can you pray for me? I'm sick. Can you pray for me? I've got this concern. I just lost my job. Can you pray for me? Why else would we then do that? But we're, we're making those prayers and requests, we're making them known to God. Now, I, I think we've got to be very careful about saying what we can and cannot do when the scriptures are very clear or excuse me, are not very clear about what we can and cannot do when it comes to things like that. We commonly ask other people to pray for us, but nowhere in the New Testament does it say that you should do that, but we're doing it anyway. And you inferred a little while ago that we shouldn't be doing that. We shouldn't be in front of an icon asking that saint or whatever to pray for us. So I, I think, we again, we've got to be careful about definitions and what words mean and what actions mean that come from them. Yeah, but first of all, if you're looking at the word prayer, it's not you're not just asking in prayer. Some people, they only ask in prayer, but a lot of times you're thanking God. You, 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 it's more than just asking. So we're not taking the English word and defining what prayer means. You're, you're going to God, you're praising him. Okay, that's what prayer is. And yes, we, pray, we, we ask others to pray for us. That is true. But when a person passes on from the, from, from the living um, to, to eternity, okay, for them to hear us, for, for them to hear our prayers, a lot of times people are also silently praying. So they're going in our minds and hearing what we're saying. Scripture does not say that at all. And it is, it is warned against consistently not to rely on man-made traditions, but to stand on what the word of God says. The scriptures are, are sufficient in it and going to God is sufficient. We don't have to go and say, okay, I need to go and uh, ask Mary to intercede for me or any particular saint to intercede for me. Again, nowhere in scripture is that ever shown. And can I just interrupt one second, guys? I want to give uh, uh, Father Jonathan the, the final word here. Tyler, uh, I think this kind of bleeds into the second question about sin. And I, I, I know we're kind of yeah. getting far afield. <laughs> we are. Yeah, we started with graven we images like, yeah. and, and went to veneration. Or, uh, oh, I know. We started about prayers. Yeah. That's good. Um, no, but I like it because it it's, it, it's going It bleeds into your second question. Yeah, yeah it bleeds it into your second question. So uh, I want... Um, um, uh, Dr. Jonathan to just give a quick response and then I'm going to ask that second question for Tyler since he wants us to divide them up so um, and, and it just follows from this in a way so I yeah. think it, it's organic and in it, in how it's coming so n not to bash on anybody <laughs> it's a good transition point yeah uh, David, I must correct you. You 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 very unceremoniously elevated me to Doctor Jonathan. And, oh, um, I did the same sorry. thing. <laughs> Should I wish to have such such nomenclature after my last name? But uh, <laughs> I, I'm just a simple M Div, not a not a whatever. <laughs> All right, Father. So uh, if you could just want to give a quick response there. Thank you for the correction. <laughs> sure. Um, well, again, staying on this topic of, of what Exodus 2014 is saying, uh, again, the the admonition or, or or the prohibition rather there is very clear. You shall not make any graven image and bow down and worship them. And icons are not graven images. I think we can we can prove that from just definitions and things like that. Uh, and we do not bow down and worship to them. We bow down to them sometimes. Um, in an act of veneration, but we do not worship and we do not give to an icon 
that which is due only to God alone. Now, praying to it, th those are different issues. But I'm, we're, the, the question that we had a, that I, I was asked to answer first ex is, is Exodus 2014. They are not graven images. They are not idols. We do not bow down to them and we do not worship them. That, that's our teaching. Okay, Pastor Pastor Sam, uh, do you believe people who are actively venerating icons are sinning in any way, shape, or form? Yeah, I mean, I absolutely see it as sinning. Um, and again, we only need to look at Scripture to see that. So if we look at Rev Revelation uh, chapter 22, verse 8 through 9, uh, it says, I, John, and the one who heard... And the one who heard and saw these things, and when I heard and saw them, I fell down and worshipped, which is proskuneo, at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant uh, with you and your brothers and the prophets and with those who keep the word of this book. Worship proskuneo, God. So here, I just want to bring this point here. How is it possible that the angel here refuses veneration, refuses proskuneo, okay, from John, and yet, and even says that we're supposed to worship or venerate proskuneo only God, and yet, for example, you go into an Orthodox church and they'll have an icon of an angel where people will proskuneo in front of that icon and, and venerate it. So this is this is where I see the conflict here, and I think. Um, and you see this throughout scripture, Acts 10, verse 25 to 26. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down on his feet and worshiped, proskuneo him. But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up, I too am a man. And again, you see the exact same thing and, and the same logic. How is it that we'll have an icon of Peter bow down to it when in the scriptures, when the same act happens, he says no. And same, if we go back to with John's um, example, John didn't think the angel was God. Uh, he, he, John clearly has a great Christology. We only have to look at the Gospel of John to see that. But the act of bowing down in, in, a, in a sense of reverence to some, somebody or an angel was considered wrong and a violation. And then we look at Matthew 4, verses 9 through 10. And he said to him, all these things I give to you. And again, this is Satan speaking to Jesus. And he said, and all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship proskuneo me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written. Again, Jesus is making his appeal from scripture. You shall worship proskuneo, the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And we see that this is all throughout scripture. And I have a ton of scripture references here. But for the sake of time, if you just do a word study on proskuneo, and yes, there are examples where a person may bow down, like uh, with, with Joseph and his brothers there. But when when you're when you see somebody and you're venerating them, that's considered a violation. And and we see that uh, people are rebuked in Scripture when that happens. So for me, when I look at the evidence of Scripture, yes, absolutely, I see it as a sin. Father Jonathan, I want to give you a chance to respond, but I really have a an itching question. I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Sam. Uh, but I'd like to clarify something just real quick. Uh, I did do that uh, very same thing that you just recommended everybody to do a word search of Proskuneo, and what I found was very interesting in Revelation three. I want to read seven through nine because this was man, this blew me away, and I want to see if it changes your opinion um, or or how you would answer this. Maybe not change your opinion, but how you would answer uh, this because that word is used here. So in Revelation 3, uh, verse 7, it says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write the following, This is the solemn pronouncement of the Holy One, the True One, who holds the key of David, who opens doors no one can shut, and shuts doors no one can open. I know your deeds. Look, I have put in front of you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have a little strength, but you have obeyed my word and have not denied my name. Verse 9, listen, I am going to make those people from the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews yet are not, but are lying. Look, I will make them come and bow down, proskuneo, at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. This is Jesus saying that these people, these Jews who are not, are going to proskuneo at the feet of his saints. How do you understand that in, in light of what you just said? So, for example, if you see a king, or or or, or like when um, you look at um, Joseph, the proskuneo was there done as a respect for his position as a king, versus when you see with with Peter or with the um, the angel, there was a veneration done, mm -hmm. and I th that's the difference. You have somebody who's there. That's why you can bow down as a sense of respect, but then there is veneration, and that's what I would challenge the Orthodox 
Well, well, can you explain why what John did with the angel was forbidden and wrong, and yet we can do the exact same action as John to the icon? I'd be how happy do you explain to. that from the Orthodox perspective? Go ahead, Father sure. Jonathan. Well, again, let's go back to the example in Revelation. The angel rebuked John. And let's take a step back. You can, proskuneo, you can bow down in two ways, to venerate or to worship. Now, Pastor Sam just brought up the example of a king or you know someone like that. That would be an, an example and perhaps a proper example in, in those times of the act of bowing down to venerate a, a king who, you know, for whatever reason. In, in Revelation, the example is very clear. The angel rebuked John because the intent of bowing down was to worship the angel. Not to venerate the angel, but to worship the angel. And the angel rebuked him and said, get up, stop it. What you want to do is do to God alone. So he was telling him, what you're offering me is improper. Because what you want to offer me can only be offered to God. He corrected John. John was wrong. And he corrected him. So you could, excuse me, you can bow down to venerate and you can bow down to worship. Uh, Jacob bowing down seven times before he saw his brother Esau is an example that's very similar to the one that Pastor Sam brought up of offering veneration to someone that it, it's due or whatever. But you can bow down with the wrong intent, and that's the important thing. What is the intent of offering the bowing down? You know, is it veneration or is it worship? And John and Revelation did the wrong thing. And other examples abound. And I would say we, we, there's similarities that we agree that um, with Proskuneo, it's what the, the, is the intent. So we we do agree there. So that is common ground that we have, and I'm, I'm glad we have that. And I think this agreement is coming on. Um, yeah, I know that's that's awesome. And, and it's just the disagreement on what when it's what is it appropriate, for example, for icons or not. So it is good that we are having some common ground here, and the disagreement is coming there. So um, can I can I just jump in real quick, and I would like. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ivanov to respond to this. Father, we, stop doing we that. No, well, father, father, father. Did I say doctor again? You did. Yes, you, oh did. You, did you didn't call me doctor even once. No. <laughs> it's it's, it's because you don't have the FR. You have the beard. I look at you more like a, a Calvin or something. Or Luther. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm no, is my doctor. new best friend, by the way. So um, <laughs> after they answer this, do you want me to go into question three or? Yeah. Uh, well, no. I want I want them to to talk it out because we know that. Okay. Guys, it, this has been a, a, a hot topic in the church, and yeah. it was a hot topic before the Council of Nicaea II and way after the Council of Nicaea II. Um, and I just wanted to say that they, they had the same kind of issues here. And I just want to ask you, I want to read this quote and, and get your, your perspective too. And is this kind of where you guys are coming together and where you – uh, uh, disagree, and what do you think about this specific statement? It is one thing to adore a man, that is to greet him with this duty of a salutation and with the um, obstinance of politeness and reverence. It is another to adore a picture for that we should show brotherhood, love, and reverence toward our neighbors. We are taught by examples in scripture. But we are expressly forbidden to adore or to greet images. And that comes from the Council of Frankfurt in 794. So that would be my question. Are you guys kind of saying that, yes, it's okay to, uh, you know, greet somebody in salutation like the kings of, of the past and stuff like that. But um, this kind of goes deeper where he talks about images. And I just wanted to get your response to that. Uh, Father uh, Ivanov. Well, um, again, I think the Bible has many instances of proskuneo, in other words, bowing down in veneration, in honor, in respect to the king, to a prophet, to to whatever. I think that that those things are there. And if Pastor Sam and I agree on that principle, that it is it is okay to bow down in veneration to another then that principle, if we agree on it, and I don't know that we agree on it totally, is the same principle that applies to how we treat icons. We don't bow down in worship. We reject that. We think that is abhorrent. 
we don't bow down and worship because we're not offering sacrifice or anything to the icon. We don't do that. What we're bowing down in veneration of the person the icon represents. And I, I got some things that we got some questions coming up later that, that I'll address this a little bit more. Um, but if the principle that the biblical example provides of bowing down in veneration to other people, David, just like you kind of pointed out from that statement, if we agree on that, and I think there's some agreement here between him and I on that, then there is not there there is not a huge leap from that statement, from that agreement to the veneration of icons. So like, and this is just the last follow-up and I'll give it over to Dale. Um, and this is for both of you guys. Um, so when we look in the Septuagint at uh, worship and stuff like that, and there is no distinguishing between Latreia and Dulia in the Septuagint when it comes to religious settings. Is that true? Uh, I'll, I'll go with Pastor Sam first. Oh, with Dulia and Latreia? Yeah. Uh, well... I'm going to jump ahead. Um, oh, sorry. Have, uh, if that's something, if there's something there uh, that you guys want to go over later, you can just ignore I that. Think that's on. on the list, David. It, it might be. I haven't read these questions since for a month. <laughs> no, no worries. Do, you want, do you want me to wait until we get there? Yeah, or? you can wait till, okay. until we get there. We can get there. I, I actually did have another clarifying question. If I could toss that in there for just a second, because it's relevant yeah, to what yeah. we were just talking about yeah. um, is um, uh, Jonathan was talking about, bowing to a king or a dignitary or a prophet or something like that uh, and how that veneration which is a uh, let's say an expression of deep regard or respect or reverence or something like that toward this figure and perhaps the authority that they represent because that also is the thing that's being bowed to let's say uh, in the comments there's somebody who is saying that it th there's a distinction in the fact that uh, bowing to a king is not in a religious context. Do you think that that's a relevant distinction, or is that I think something that's, that a, that's a that's a false dichotomy? Because in the Old Testament, there was no difference between the king and the and the and the country, you know, the king and the state. Well, that's kind of what I meant by the authority that they represent is that they're a, that let's say they're a stand-in for the nation uh, in that in that personification. Well, of course as, they as were, but they were also a stand-in for the religion. Okay, so 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 then in in that sense, the king of Israel would also be. Mm. Um, I can I can see how that would make sense that the king of Israel would also be a representative of God. Um, Absolutely, he was, and he was called that in the Old Testament. David, Solomon, they were called that. Okay, so then see, so then you don't think that that's a that's that's not a distinction that would actually make amount to a difference in 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 terms of what you were explaining. So I think that's. Well, I don't think it would be, but then again, the the Roman Empire after its Christianization pretty much adopted that same very model. You know, the Roman emperor, and and I refuse to call them Byzantine emperors because the, the Roman Empire did not call itself Byzantine. The Roman Empire, uh, Roman emperor, was a very interesting uh, a person in that he could call ecumenical councils. He attended ecumenical councils. When he took communion, he went inside the the altar area to commune. And so forth. There were a lot of things that, uh, you know, Justinian, Justinian wrote a hymn that is still sung 1,500 years later in our church. So there's a lot that that the the Roman emperors were and and represented that Western Europe only had a, a shadow of in their royal houses. It, it was really quite an extraordinary institution that that of course is no more. And the Russian SARS were very similar in their approach to that as well. <clears throat> Pastor yeah, Sam, just, I thought you was going to, yeah, go ahead. go ahead. Yeah, just my input is I, I do think the religious setting plays a huge factor. Um, again, when we look at an archaeology, we'll find that there, there is Christian artwork. Um, that, that is something that we find. Um, but we notice that over time, a lot of the artwork, the, the Christian artwork that we find were, were scenes or scenes from the scriptures and later on made into portraits. And during that change, when they started making portraits, that's when the veneration of icons continued to become more of a problem and, and had to be um, addressed. And so, Pastor, when do you think that started? Uh, if, you, if, if you want to look at the history of it, so you look at when, when Constantine, uh, well, I, I got the dates here so I can give you the dates. Now, when you said they started making portraits and so forth, when do you think that started? In the fourth century. In the 300s? Yeah. Okay. Here's a problem with dating 
iconography and iconology in our church, specifically iconography. Everyone who is thinking that this is a development that came later, and the reason for that is we don't have evidence of iconography much earlier than about the sixth century, has to remember that in the seventh, excuse me, in the eighth century, in the 700s, when the Roman Emperor Leo decided, oh, icons bad, let's go get them, and sent his army into monasteries and the churches, grabbing icons, smashing them, burning them, things like that. There was a civil war that effectively took place in, in the Roman Empire that lasted about 140 years over icons, and a lot of blood was spilled during that time. Now, it is often <coughs> conjectured that Leo did what he did because not much more than about 50 years earlier uh, of his ascendancy to the Roman throne, the throne of, of Constantinople, uh, there was this upstart guy in the Middle East named Mohammed that was causing a lot of problems. And indeed, in time, his armies took over a lot of Roman Empire territory. And one of the first things they did when they entered churches and monasteries is, is they are iconoclasts. And the first thing they did is they would whitewash over the iconography and churches if they didn't already appropriate them for as, as mosques and so forth. Uh, they smashed a lot of icons and so forth and, and destroyed them because they didn't like that kind of imagery. So when Leo came around and, and the Roman Empire started doing the same thing to their own, this is why we don't have a record of icons that go back hundreds of years. We hear about them, but we don't see them because much of what existed in the Roman Empire, in the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, Leo couldn't get to the West because they weren't really that cooperative at the time. And the reason we have <clears throat> icons like the one called Christ the Pantocrator that existed in the St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai that dates from the early to mid uh, uh, sixth century. The only reason some of that stuff exists is because it existed behind Roman Empire boundaries and they were protected somewhat by being in Islamic territory. But everything in Greece and in Turkey, what is now Turkey, uh, and so forth that was under the Roman Empire, that doesn't, we don't have anything that goes back a long time. So when we start asking the question, why don't we see stuff? Oh, then it must have started in the seventh century. It must have started in the eighth century, or it started after Nicaea. That's looking at evidence that just doesn't even exist and drawing conclusions that you can't draw. So I'm just appealing to people when they start saying things like, Oh, look at the historical record. There is no historical record. It was destroyed over a 200-year period, if not by Muslims, then by Romans themselves, by the Roman army uh, themselves. So um, we don't have a lot of proof other than what was remaining in the catacombs in Italy. We really don't have a lot of proof of iconography much before Constantine other than that, and that does exist. Father, but we don't Father. know about individual portraits and so forth. They don't exist. Why? Because most of them were destroyed. And the West didn't have a tradition of iconography. The East did, but the West didn't. The West had statues. We had icons. That, that was the way it worked. Father Jonathan, just one quick follow-up on that. Um, but uh, do you see a development at all? Because, I mean, even in the catacombs, those pictures – that we see of Christian art could also be supplemented, like uh, the Good Shepherd could also be supplemented for Hermes, uh, the the goat bearer. So I mean, it, these these pictures we get from the catacombs and stuff, they look like also pagan deities. They don't look like what we have in our icons in the future, you know. So I, it just it seems that that you can't deny the development, and this is why I think most. <laughs> uh, um, you know, historians would agree with that, but I want to get your response to that. Why it looks like there is, and maybe, maybe there isn't, maybe you have something else that, that you could say on that. Well, first of all, a lot of what's in the Roman catacomb uh, catacombs, a lot of it is severely degraded over the last 1900 years or so. It's hard to really make out what a lot of it is. And it's only through fancy photography, which I won't go into here, that they've been able to make out images at all. Now, if one wants to see an iconographic tradition that goes back to the third century, to the 200s, one has to reference both the synagogue and the baptistry at Dura Europis. 
Now, I would just encourage anybody who has never heard of this to look up Dura, D-U-R-A, Europus, just like it sounds, and look up the synagogue and the baptistry that, that, that are there. The images in both date back to at least the third century. Now, what's interesting about that is how developed they are, by the way, and how complete they are and preserved they are. But that baptistry and that synagogue stopped being used in the third century for different reasons, which means that the images there were created even earlier and don't date just from the third century. They date from an, a, a time that we can't really determine very well because we don't know when they were made. But we know when the synagogue and the baptistry closed, and we know they closed in the third century. So um, the idea that, that you would have both a Jewish synagogue and a Christian baptistry that contained well-developed Christian iconography, or not in the case of the, the synagogue, but contained well-developed iconography, period, in the synagogue of Old Testament scenes and Old Testament prophets and in the, in the baptistry of images of Christ and so forth, um, then when you talk about development, you have to have a causal link between stages to be able to define that. And the Roman catacombs really don't provide that. A lot of the other historical record, I would argue, as I recently did, has been destroyed. So we don't have the causal link from one century to the next. But Dura Europus is one place where we do have a causal link, and the link is quite good. Well, something about Dura Europus that we should also mention is that the images that they find are also not in the worship center. They're in different places in the church. And that's something that we should take into consideration why they, on purpose, avoided putting images in those areas. Again, fear of leading to idolatry. And, and well, I think no, 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 no. There, there is no church at Dura Europus. There's a baptistry that survives, and there's a synagogue that survives. Now, the synagogue is worship space, and it's filled with imagery from the Old Testament. Baptistries back in the day were separate buildings from the church temple itself. They weren't part of the church itself. They were separate buildings. So to say that there are images in a place that's not the center of Christian worship would be, yeah, it's a baptistry. People went there to be baptized. And so the images that they found in there are images that all have to do with baptism uh, of one sort or another. They, they, again, there's places you can go online to read about this that really explain in great detail what those images are and have photographs of them and things like that. The point is, to, to David's question about development, um, it's very hard to, pr to prove or to, 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 to find causal linkage from one century to the next to be able uh, to clearly define an answer to that. Can I, ask yeah, but I think something should be mentioned here, too, is that you may not have you could argue that, you know, archaeologically, archaeologically, that things were destroyed. But at the same time, um, in unison, you also find that the early fathers did not talk about veneration of icons during the early time period. So there's no written proof. There's no archaeological proof. And I think there's a different history that we should be paying attention to. So Emperor Constantine, he converted to Christianity in 312 AD and did the Edict of Milan in 313 AD. Once he did that, he made Christianity legal, but not just that, he also made it popular because in order to, to grow in status, you knew that being a Christian had benefits. And then Emperor Theodosius, um, when, when he reigned from 379 to 395 AD, he put his Edict of Thessalonica in 380. Now, once he did that, he made Christianity mandatory. In fact, they would persecute pagans. So now you have more nominal Christians coming in, fake Christians, people who are just Christians by name. If you're going to be having that happening for hundreds whoa, of years. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Who are you to judge whether they were nominal or fake Christians? When you My force goodness, people, you're really ready to make that statement? You can judge them as to what the, the degree of their faith was? If you look at that ramifications afterwards, yes, you can oh, see the ramifications. Fruit of what I'm talking about looking into the hearts of people. Be very careful about judging people's level of faith from 1700 years ago. I don't think you can make that that jump. You will know them by their fruits. They, look at what happens, and if you look, and look at the growth of the church during that time, look at the people that were being baptized. Because it was a state church that you were forced into or you were going to be persecuted. That is not the way Jesus came to share the good news. It was a state religion. And like you said, why do you think the popes and the, or the patriarchs should say in the Orthodox Church wear those crowns? 
That's because they represented the emperor. Everything became royal. They built huge uh, churches and everything. Th those Pastor, things the crowns didn't come until after the fall of Constantinople. That that came much, much later for a very different reason. Um, yeah, yeah. But to go back much, coming much later, I, I, that's fine. But I'm just saying, if you look at that, what happened in history, when you see nominal Christianity entering the church, you see that it makes sense of what we see with icons. So for at least for the first 300 years of Christianity, no mention is done or no evidence is found of veneration of icons. And okay. why is that? I mean, let's, let's think this through. Why is that? The early church wasn't concerned with veneration of icons any more than it was concerned with how to venerate Mary or intercede with the saints or call no man father. It wasn't concerned with any of those apologetics. The only apologetic that mattered was Jesus is Lord. And they were trying to explain the salvation that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ brought to the world. That was the focus. Iconography was not. Iconography was more an internal dogma. It wasn't the external kerygma being preached to the world, being justified in letters to heretics and things like that. It wasn't important to be uh, talked about at that time because the, the important thing to talk about was the central tenet of Christianity, which was the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was what all the early church fathers pretty much were talking about. And when something came up that had them referencing Mary or the saints or icons or whatever, it was in passing, not as the subject of a tome that they had to write a lot about. It just wasn't of interest to them to explain to the outside world these things when the outside world would not have any appreciation for them. But if you look at the evidence, what you constantly see from the early fathers is that they are constantly speaking against the veneration of images. So and there's seeing, a context to that, and I already mentioned that with St. Irenaeus. You don't put an, a, a, an image of Christ next to a pagan philosopher in a church, but that's what was being done. That's the context of the complaint there in his letter. And when they do talk about it, there's a context. And it's not that icons are wrong. It's the wrong use of icons is what they're talking about. I believe if you look at the evidence and see that how it's lacking historically, it's, it's lacking from early fathers, it's lacking archaeologically, th this is a problem. And yes, some people may be able to just dismiss that and be okay with that. But I believe people who are paying attention to history, they do have a problem with that. And they see that it was only in the fourth and fifth century that there was the emergence of portraits. And later on, the people were starting to venerate them and the, and the fathers spoke against it. And it's not until the sixth and seventh century that the veneration of icons actually becomes widely practiced. Again, why would that happen when you have an influx of people forced to be Christian? That's going to cause problems. And maybe all, you can say you can't judge them, but we, we have to pay attention of what's happening in history and realize when we do things unbiblically, what do you expect? Okay, let, 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 that something needs to be corrected here. No one after Theodosius's edict was forced to be baptized. Religion became the official, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, true, but no one was forced into holy baptism. It was encouraged and so forth, but if someone said to you, will you be baptized? No, not yet. Oh, okay. It wasn't that you were punished for that. We have to be very clear on that. That's yeah, not what happened pagan, after 381. If they, to, if they went to their pagan temples and other things, pagan lands were taken away. They were persecuted. Yeah, that's right. They were. Yeah. But so, not Christian lands, not not the lands of someone who refused, uh, who, who said, I'm just not ready yet. This is when the long catechumenate period started, where people yeah. recognized that, you know, these people aren't ready. We've got to train them better than we were doing. So that's when one, two, three-year catechumenate periods began. But Father, do you see that there was a difference in like ideas of baptism at that time? Maybe that's why that, that didn't extend to that area. I know that's a little far afield. I mean, we had Constantine and that whole idea where let's get baptized right at the end. You know, <laughs> let's 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 do it at the end so we go straight to heaven. You know, we don't have to go to purgatory. No, 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 David. Right? Do you know why he got baptized late? Why? I know. I mean, I would, uh, here, I'm, I'm, no, no. I, I mean, uh, from what I've done in all my church history classes, is that there were different ideas at the time. Well, uh, of, the reason that doesn't the, the reason that it Constantine did not get baptized was because how do you be a Christian emperor? What 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 must you do? How must you govern? It there just was no precedent for it. 
And so he put it off as long as he could. And when he was on his deathbed, he was baptized at that time. Now, what happened to Theodosius is he too got sick, was baptized on his deathbed, and then got better. And so when he got better, he had to deal with the fact that now he was baptized and a Christian emperor. Now, what do I do? But the way in which many um, uh, people through time have dealt with that baptism has been very interesting. Uh, Boris of Bulgaria, Vladimir of Kiev, and others, when they accepted baptism, one of the first things they did is they got, they got rid of the death penalty. They uh, forbid torture of prisoners and things like that. They, they took their faith seriously. As they understood it, they tried to live it as rulers uh, during very dark and turbulent times. Yeah, but we should also consider that um, Constantine was baptized by a bishop who fouled Arius. No, you know what? That that rumor is going around like wildfire, and that's not entirely true. Eusebius was not an, a, a full Arian, a full-blown Arian. He may have had I, sympathies, but he was I, still a, a, uh, uh, a Nicene bishop when he baptized Constantine. He, he had not been deposed. He had not been excommunicated. He had not been kicked out of the church. He was still a part of the Nicene church. Hey guys, I I'm think gonna... if you just look at Constantine's kids, then a lot of them follow Arius' teachings and everything. You can see that. And even his practices when he was an emperor, after saying he was a Christian, producing coin with pagan things on it, killing people. I mean, he was not um, a believer. He was not somebody who had the Holy Spirit. Well, in when you talk about killing people, who are you referring to? Wasn't his family members that he was killing? Do you know why? No, I don't have the history. Okay, on. again, context is everything. And again, let's not make claims and throw out statements that we don't un understand history or what's being done. It, it is said that Constantine did not take his faith seriously because he had his son and heir Crispus, his eldest son Crispus, killed. And then later, it is known, he had his wife Fausta killed. Now, people look at the that that simple statement and they don't understand. Um, why that happened? You know, why would he kill his son? Why would he kill his wife? Well, his wife, as as history demonstrates, was Constantine's second wife, Fausta, and she wanted her son to succeed to the throne. So how do you do that? You get rid of the heir. And she accused Crispus of trying to rape her. And Constantine believed her and he had Crispus put to death. Then when he found out Fausta lied to him, he had her put to death. So there's a context to what he did and why he did it. These were dynastic struggles. Emperors did not want to have to go through dynastic struggles, and she forced one on him that could have destabilized the entire empire and brought to the throne people who did not see uh, the Nicene God as he did. I want to let uh, Pastor Sam respond, and then Dale, if you want to go ahead. We're So we're starting to get off in the weeds, and that's why we're here, right, to, to bring everything back on track. Uh, but Dale, um, so Pastor Sam, I lied to you a while ago. I do want, I didn't realize I had two questions for you right in a row. Uh, <laughs> so we, it's up to you guys. We can either ask uh, Sam that third question, or if we want to skip to the fourth question and ask Father Jonathan and then come back to the third question after that, it's up to you guys. Sam, do you feel like answering two questions in a row or do we want to hit Father Jonathan? No, that's question. fine. I don't mind. That's fine. Okay. So after the, go ahead and respond. I don't want to take away from, from pastor Sam's time, please. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead, pastor Sam. And then Dale, if you would ask the third question on the list. Yeah. And for the sake of time, I, th I think we discussed this, this last point um, well enough and we can just jump to the third one now. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Dale. And by the way, before we do that, I just want to remind our audience, we are taking audience uh, questions. So if you have a question for either Pastor Samuel or Father Jonathan, please put that in the comments. If you would, we, the comments are going kind of crazy. Uh, put uh, hashtag faith unaltered or at faith unaltered, excuse me, not hashtag at faith unaltered. So we make sure we get your questions. And just to remind everybody, if you want to financially support our ministry, hit us with a super chat and your question will jump to the front of the line. Go ahead, Dale. All right. So, Pastor Sam, um, I just want to know, would you say that the early church uh, did venerate at least things like places, you know, such as making the pilgrimage to Jerusalem uh, or even people in objects like like various relics? Um, if, your, if your answer is yes to this, then do you think there's any difference in the practice and, and veneration of icons? Um, if you answer no, um, then how would you describe what the early church was doing in these pilgrimages and honoring of the bones of the martyrs and stuff? So I would say no, the early church did not practice veneration of places and relics. 
that is this in the same manner that is currently being practiced by the Orthodox Church. It looks completely different. For example, the kissing and bowing down to relics was not found in the second or third century, and again was a later development. I think it's important to pay attention to the evidence we have from Scripture and see that this was also, in line with everything else, a later development. Uh, we need to also consider, too, the prominent early fathers like Athanasius, who was also very much against the idea of venerating relics as part of a religious practice. Uh, John of Damascus, again, as we talked about, the prominent defender of icons, he admits this in his treatise on icons. He says, and we know the blessed Asinesios objected to the bodies of the saints being put into caskets and that he preferred their burial in the ground, wishing to set the knot, the stage custom of the Egyptians who did not bury their dead underground, but set them up on beds and couches. So even with Asinesios' thinking, he saw this as, again, a pagan thing. He said, no, it's better for, for people to just be buried and not to be displayed the way that the, pagan, that the Egyptian pagans were doing. Even if we look at the cross being venerated, that was also a later development. The cross became a popular item of adoration after the labrium, which was the symbol and the standard of Constantine's army. And this was based on the shape of the cross and had begun to appear on coins in the fourth century. At the same time, the growth of the cult of relics, such as the fragments of the true cross, increased to an expen exponential rate. They had so many different relics of the true cross that if you put them all together, they could have built a ship. I mean, it was, it was out of this world what people were doing with the relics. So the justification for bowing down and kissing crosses and relics and icons is not justified by scripture or church history. It clearly was an evolution. Many people will appeal to Polycarp's bones, how they were collected after his martyrdom, yet they never bowed down and kissed it. The historical record that we have actually says this, later we collected up his bones, more precious than jewels and better purified than gold, and put them in an appropriate place where the Lord willing, we will celebrate the birthday of his martyr martyrdom each year with joy and rejoicing, both to remember those who had run their race and to prepare those yet to walk in their steps. Now, if you notice what they're saying here, they're not doing anything here that's inappropriate. They're, they're, there's no bowing down and kissing. They're honoring it in the same way that we would honor a loved one. Same thing in scripture. You'll see appeals to Elijah's bones, Peter's shadow, Paul's handkerchief as you use as defenses for relics. But again, if we look at the context in scripture, it's important and very telling. 2 Kings 13, verse 20 to 21. So Elijah died and they buried him. Now bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of the year. And a man was being buried. Behold, the Marandang band was seen and the man was thrown into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elijah, he was buried and stood on his feet. So first we have to notice that Elijah here was buried. Okay, so that was the custom of what was done. He wasn't, they didn't save his remains to be as relics or anything. And nor did they, after this miracle was done, did they uh, just take his bones and remains. They didn't, they didn't practice this veneration of relics. Acts 5, verse 12 to 15. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hand of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared to join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord's to the Lord, multitude of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on the cots and mats. And as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. And again, whether we take this as Peter's shadow actually healing them or not, or the people just doing that, if we just look at it as Peter's shadow healing them. Again, this was, again, not the same thing as the veneration of relics. There's no bowing down. There's no kissing. There's no object that's being venerated. If you look at Acts 19, verse 12 to 11 to 12, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even the handkerchiefs or aprons that he had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Again, the miracle that was happening here was not the same thing. People were not kissing it or venerating it. And, and his handkerchiefs were not something that the church just held on to and had a record of. We have no record that the church held on to the handkerchiefs as some type of relic as practiced in, in the church. So when we look at relics and, and we see what how they're being treated, we see that this was a, a an innovation. This happened afterwards, that this is not the practice of the church. 
And again, when we look at what is being said by the early fathers in regards to icons, we're consistently seeing the same exact thing. And we can't dismiss someone like Origen, who was a historical witness, who said, being taught in the school of Jesus Christ have rejected all images and statues. He's making it clear that when people were, were taught Christianity, they rejected all statues. This was what the people at the time believed in. Um, there's also Lactentius that we should look at, who says, therefore, images are d- devoid of religion. And there, there's no religion where there is an image. And you see these statements consistently. And then you look at Eusebius, the, the church historian, um, about 327 AD. He received a letter from the emperor's sister, Constantina, asking him for a picture of Christ. He rebukes her for the request, saying that such images are inadequate and lead to idolatry. Again, you're seeing here that he is stating that the images here will lead to idolatry. He reports that a woman had brought him two likenesses, which she claimed were the images of Paul and Christ. He confiscated them, lest they should prove a stumbling block to her and to others. Again, you see this consistently. And then you see it also with those who are recognized as official saints in the Eastern Orthodox and Oriental Church, Clement of Alexandria, talks about work of art cannot be sacred and divine. Again, that's a statement that goes against the idea of, of icon. And, okay. and, and Epiphanes can't be just pushed away, but we already talked about him. But when you look at the consensus of the fathers, you look at what was in the true early church, they were rebuking people who venerated images, regardless of whether those images were pagans or of, of Christ or, or a saint. All right. Awesome. Well, I, I see Father Jonathan uh, vigorously shaking his head no to a lot of what you said. So, uh, yeah, to, why don't you kick off the discussion there, Father Jonathan? I'm not sure where to begin. Um, the, the question was about visiting places and venerating relics. Um, let's put some historical context to that answer. Number one, <clears throat> Christians um, brought a new understanding to pilgrimage because the idea of going someplace like Jerusalem wasn't something that started until Christianity became legal and then the official religion of the empire. And people, new Christians, in hearing about the stories of Jesus, wanted to go see where all of them took place. That was not possible before because of the era of persecutions. Uh, but it was possible now. And so people wanted to go to the Mi- Middle East, to, to the Holy Land, and see um, and see them. But in reality, uh, for the first 300 years, the, the church really didn't have what we could call, I guess, a theology of place because of the, 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 the various, um, uh, the theophany of the Lord, the transfiguration, so many other uh, things that the church celebrated the church understood that the whole world was sacred. The whole world was now a holy land. The whole world now belonged to Jesus Christ. Um, And therefore there was no need to go anywhere in particular. Once Christianity became legal, that began to change. And so Helena went to Jerusalem to find the true cross, which according to the stories of that time, um, she did and um, founded the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Church of the Resurrection, the Anastasis, uh, as well as other churches in Bethlehem and elsewhere. And this created a, a tourism trade, you know, people wanting to go and um, and see the places where the Lord was. Um, I don't think that's that's any different, quite frankly, than a family taking their children to Washington, D.C. to see the various things there, including the Constitution and the Declaration and, and things of that nature. People like to go to, who are students of history, like to go to Boston to see Concord and Lexington. Uh, people want to go to see where things happened. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. We don't really hold, um, you know, you know, we're not like Muslims that have to make a hajj, you know, a pilgrimage in our lifetime uh, to Jerusalem or anywhere, um, because we have all around us, holy land, holy space, a holy world. Um, So the idea of going to visit um, is not something that should be controversial. What people did when they went there might be a different question, but the question of uh, a theology of place 
should not be in, in question at all. Now, when they went there, um, I would first point out that there have been studies done of all of the reliquaries all around the world that claim to hold a piece of the true cross. And contrary to the cynics who would say, uh, if you had them all together, you could have a forest, these studies have shown that all of those reliquaries and the size of the wood that's in them would make a beam approximately five or six feet long. So it's really not an entire forest. Um, having now said that, I want to talk about the things that Pastor Sam brought up, beginning with Second Kings. Um, he said they, he, they didn't take his bones. Well, naturally, that was in the Old Testament. The Old Testament didn't have a concept of relics. But what is being demonstrated in Second Kings is the kind of holiness in even relics that still perform miracles even long after the prophet has died. That there is a holiness that comes to people through their participation through the Holy Spirit in, 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 in the community of faith, first the Old Testament, then the New Testament, that makes things about them or things that they wear or touch, like the, the story about the uh, Peter shadow or the handkerchiefs that Paul had, that even makes that kind of stuff holy. Now, Pastor Sam then said, well, we don't have those handkerchiefs. Well, of course we don't have those handkerchiefs. People took them. They did whatever with them. We don't know what they did with them, by the way. And we don't know what happened to them. Probably nothing. Maybe they were handed down. We don't know. But at the time, that was not the concern. Oh, I got to get this handkerchief to, to Sophia because she's sick. Nobody was thinking about, oh, I better not get it dirty so I can pass it down to my great-great-grandchildren. That was not something that was thought of back then. But what the stories in Second Kings and uh, Matthew and you know Acts and so forth show or demonstrate is that holiness is something that exudes from the person who has been united to Christ in his holy church. And, and these are all examples of the use of relics, whether bones or the shadows or uh, the handkerchiefs. Um, it, it, I, I think we're getting a little too cynical when we say that these kinds of things aren't special when indeed if the bones of somebody makes a dead man stand up um, and revive him, then there is certainly something very holy about those bones, which brings us to Polycarp and so forth. The fact that the people uh, wanted to um, gather them, which they did with St. Irenaeus, by the way, also, and, and others, um, the story of the Holy 40 Martyrs of Sebast, which is from the middle of the third century, says the same thing, that after they died, the church came and took their relics, their bodies, and took them and, uh, and, and buried them, but treated them with great respect and veneration. Um, let, let, me, let me say this about what the church says about relics. It, it doesn't say that there's some magical power in them. The church just says that relics may be the occasion of God's miracles, and in this the church follows scripture that Pastor Sam pointed out, Second Kings, Acts, and so forth. So I would also add this by St. Jerome. In the fourth century, the great biblical scholar, St. Jerome, declared, we do not worship, we do not adore, for fear that we should bow down to the creature rather than the, to the creator, but we venerate the relics of the martyrs in order to better adore him whose martyrs they are. All right, awesome. Well, uh, David, uh, since Tyler's gone, uh, do you want me to have them engage, or do you want to go to Josh? Well, of course. For no, they, no, they can they can engage a little bit. I'd like uh, since this is uh, Pastor Samuel's question, I'd like him to finish up. But first, uh, yeah. I want to open it up to questions from us, real quick. Um, Just because and, you got a question. <laughs> no, I want. I want. Well, I'm waiting for you guys too. You know, I I, I love. Uh, dude, yeah. I'm I'm totally entranced with this conversation. I'm learning I so much. Yeah. Um, I I love it. Um, I you know I'm seeing both trying to see both sides, and you know, um, and I got a question for both of you guys when it comes to the images aspect. Um, if this wasn't such a big deal, and I, I would love to hear what you have to say, uh, Father Jonathan, on uh, context here, but uh, the Council of Elvira did address this. 
uh, and it's canon number 36 when it talks about there shall be no in pictures in churches, lest what is worship and adored be depicted on walls. So, I mean, in light of that, what do you make of that? And also, uh, Pastor Sam, could what would you say on the context of Elvira in the fourth century in relation to not only uh, um, icons in themselves, but also to the relics as well? Um, do you think that they had an issue with the relics um, when it comes to the this council, the specific council, and does this actually all play a part in um, Elvira's decision to say this in their canons? Or do you want to answer first? Well, uh, it doesn't matter. I, 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 it's his question. Like you said, I would defer. Okay, so um, you look at the, the the Synod of Elvira, that local council. So it's important to note the the time frame. This was three hundred five or three hundred six A.D. This was in between the New Testament and Nicaea, and you had nineteen bishops who weighed in on this, and and they saw that there was a danger by putting in images that could lead to worship and adoration. So again, when you see um, what has happened with relics. Again, an example was given where people were martyred and they collected their remains and then they buried them. That's respectful. That's fine. That's not the same thing of what goes on in an Orthodox church or a Catholic church when someone venerates a relic. It's completely different. Uh, so we have to make that distinction just because you, you, you grab someone's remains and you have a respectful burial and there's respect there is not the same as touching it for a blessing, thinking that there's some type of grace or blessing in it that's different. So what you see with the Synod of Elvira is they're mentioning this, this, they didn't want people to take images and lead into sin. So I believe that they would have the same st uh, stance when it comes to relics, uh, you know, honor them. And I think that's why you see the wisdom and, and bury them under them, uh, uh, honor them, but don't go ahead and start touching them for a blessing or kissing them or venerating them in an unhealthy way. Well, I think unhealthy way is a rather loose term. Can you more specifically define what you mean by that but it turns into idolatry it turns into um, obsession w with a saint or or with a relic or you have to touch it so you can get a blessing or you believe that if you put an a, a relic on an altar now your prayers are going to be more holy i mean it leads into so many problems whoa, whoa, whoa. put relics on altars what are you talking about no no i, I i'm not um familiar if this is something that's just um i i, I believe catholics forgive me i'm not uh, well, versus, but I believe what, from what I've seen with relics, they believe if you have a relic on the altar, that that somehow makes it more of a blessing. Okay, let me let me explain that because you're half right. Every altar in an Orthodox church at some point in time will be uh, to use the word consecrated, and and what that means is a a altar is especially constructed so that in the center of the altar it can contain the relics specifically of martyred saints. Now, why do we do this? Because in the catacombs, when the martyred Christians were brought down for burial, quite often, well, not even quite often, all the time, when a liturgy was then going, a mass, a liturgy, was then going to be served, it was served right over the buried body of that martyr. And this was something that began, and we that we know, this was something that began in the first century of the Christian church and continued on, both in the West and in the East. So the idea of holding a liturgy over the martyred remains of well, the remains of martyred Christians is something that goes back to the very beginning of the church. And that's why that practice is still done. So that that's the context for what you just said. Can I ask a follow up on... practice that goes back 1900 years, in other words? Can I ask a clarifying question real quick for uh, Sam? You said something that that kind of popped out to me. You said that. Uh kissing icons and venerating them leads to idolatry is that fair yeah i mean i, I believe when, when you do that yeah it definitely leads you into that so venerating is not idolatry is that is that what you're saying well no i, I would say it is idolatry um, you said because, it leads to idolatry right which is... well okay so yeah, if I if I would rephrase it, I would say no, it's an it's an act of idolatry. So if, okay. like, yeah, I'll rephrase it and say it's an act of idolatry. Now, okay. Thank Pastor, you. I have a question I'd like to ask you. I'm 66 years old. I've been venerating icons all my life. I haven't fallen into idolatry yet. Why not? 
well, the question is, is, is ha have we uh, fallen under idolatry or not? If one holds, for example, the church into such a high place that it takes precedence over God's word, and we stand on what fathers have told us versus what God has said, have we not committed idolatry then? And yeah, I would say when you look at people who have been um, venerating icons, what they've done is they've worshipped the church itself or, or a saint itself, and they've put that over God. So well, yeah, this, this, is your, this is your interpretation of the actions of others. I can tell you for myself, and I can only speak for myself, but I can also speak for the flock entrusted to my care at my church. Nobody, and I mean nobody, in the 30 years I've been there, has ever worshipped an icon, has ever given to an icon that which is due to God. We know what's due to God, and we give to him the worship that is due and that is appropriate to him. We don't do it to the icon. But how we venerate you, the icon you know as if we are venerating the saint whose image it represents. Well, my question would be, how would you know if somebody was worshiping an icon? Because I would know by their behavior. Well, and I would know be? by the way in which they approached both the life of the church, the, the life in the church. And when I say the church, I'm not talking about a separate institution. I'm talking about the body of Christ, because that's what we believe the church is, the body of Christ, because that's what the scriptures say it is. So we believe that when a person answering the uh, call at Pentecost, uh, what should I do to be saved? Repent and be baptized. When those people repent and are baptized, they are baptized into Jesus Christ's body. So I know when people are at that point in their life, I can tell whether the protoskinesis that they are giving is either veneration or worship by how they talk and how they act and how they live their lives and things like that. I can tell as their pastor. But you can't describe what it actually anybody. looks like. If somebody's what? outside looking in, how can one tell one is venerating or one is worshiping? Well, I'm not too worried about what people from the outside think. People from the outside are always going to get something wrong about us. They always have. You have, for example, and you came from the inside. They are, they're always going to get something wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in whether the person looking in from the outside comes to me and says, I have a question about what you're doing. Good. Let's sit down and let's talk about it. Because I can assure you, friend, that what we are doing is not worship. I don't think that makes when you look at scripture, that's not that's not what it makes sense. It was something when when someone was was venerating inappropriately, it was something that one could see and see that they were under sin. But but to say that you can just tell that they're that they're worshiping or no, no, or no, no. Not. You you were you were corrected on that. When you talk about John and the angel, it was pointed out that John was rebuked by the angel because he was offering the angel worship. And he said, that's due to God alone. You were wrong in your estimation on that. Yeah, but and John, John was rebuked and corrected I, by the angel specifically for doing something he shouldn't have been doing. I trust that with John's Christology, that he did not actually worship the angel thinking that he was worshiping it. I believe he was paying what he thought would be veneration. Same thing of what the Orthodox or Catholic. No, 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 no. That's not what the angel said. Word. The angel rebuked him specifically because he understood his proskinesis as worship. And he corrected him for that. Go back and read that verse. Yeah, you read no, it I, earlier. I, I, no, I read it, it, it earlier. It, I, I, I know yes, what it, it says. Proskuneo, yes. And proskuneo, again, the intention was wrong. And that's why he wasn't just bowing down as if it was, you know, a, a king or something that you were paying respect to him. But no, it was in a religious context and it was considered wrong. That's correct. I agree with you. He was rebuked for doing the wrong thing. But I've never known anybody in the Orthodox Church to give to an icon that which is properly due to God. Uh, can I, I, I think, I think that the, the confusion perhaps, or mis, the, the mismatch between the, the questions and answers back and forth right now is, is what would be like a visual cue that you would look for to indicate this right here is worship versus this right here is veneration. What would be the visible cue? I think is what he's asking that would distinguish between the two things uh, in, in, in the way that he's envisioning. Am I, am I understanding you, Sam? No, I, I think that's a yes. good question. Pastor, please. No, no, I was just saying that that's fair. That's exactly what, what I'm, what I'm asking. you. I think that's what he's asking you, Jonathan. Oh, you're asking me that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think people would be giving to an icon, for example, or a reliquary words of praise and, and glorification, doxology, and so forth, they would properly belong to God. Does that make sense? So what about the Mariology in the Orthodox Church? 
They call her God. savior and they call her other things that are attributed to God alone. They they say that she's the propitiation of her sins. That's to God alone. And that's Again, in there's the, context in the and there's there's language to be understood there. We can talk, we can have a whole evening on Mary, as we talked about earlier, and I'd be happy to address that. I don't want to get too far afield from the questions here. So can you can you give a particular example that you would be looking for uh, in one of the, the the members in your own church, uh, uh, Father Jonathan, that you would say, no, 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 I, I need to correct you. That's inappropriate. We don't do that. Like, can you give, give an example of what you would be looking for? Like, not, you know, like specific, be, try to be as specific as possible. It would look like this thing. Well, that's a that's a good question. Because since I've never seen it, I've never really given much thought to it because I've never come across this. No priest I know has ever come across this. So, uh, what what would I be looking for? Well, um, I think I would be looking for a behavior that treated that icon or that reliquary as if it were divine, as if it were God Himself. That's what I would be looking for. Okay. Can can you imagine like a, a particular example of, of what that would look like if somebody did it and you would say, no, that's definitely it. Right. Because it's not like bowing down to it because we do that. If it, it's not we like do that you know, anyway, yeah, with the, the right. right so is um, there, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm looking for, I'm looking, just looking for a, like a, like an anecdote. It can be from your imagination of what it would look like when you encountered this is inappropriate and you would need to make that correction. So that, cause I think that's what Sam was asking originally is how would well, you know the difference, you know, uh, you and, said, and what would you that said, look like? You use my imagination. Okay. I'll do that right now. Uh, someone um, taking, oh, I, I miss liturgy today. Or I got here too late to have Holy Communion, and so they take uh, some of the the blessed, not the Holy Communion, but they take some of the blessed bread that's put out for for people to break their morning fast with, and they take that over to a reliquary, or they take that over to the icon of Jesus. Jesus, bless this bread so I can have Holy Communion, and then they try and 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 take it that way. I mean that that's absurd, but you you said <laughs> use my imagination. I'm not very creative. I, I would think something like that, where something that is normally a a corporate act of worship, um, a very specific uh, act of praise and doxology and so forth, um, is given to a, a, an icon or to a reliquary. So it wouldn't be necessarily so much the physical actions as it would be like the 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 inordinate attempt to do it yourself is something that I think you're. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. Right. Okay. Fair enough. All right. All right. Let's, uh, if you guys want, let's go ahead and move on to the next question. And so no, I, no, I'm of... sorry, uh, uh, Tyler, I just, just, if I may comment, if pastor doesn't mind, the, the reference to Elvira, Elvira was an insignificant council, quite frankly, it was a local council and some local councils are, are considered important, but that one is not. And to cite whether we're citing a single father or wh whether re we are re uh, um, uh, referencing a local council, the fact of the matter is Elvira just doesn't even register in most debates on icons and so forth. And let's let's understand one other thing: many um, uh, people um, in in early church history, pre-Constantinian, pre-Nicene church history, um, they worshipped either in the large homes of their wealthier members, I think on this we can agree, we, we understand that. Or in some cases, they had their own buildings. In Rome, they had their own building. And then the Romans knew where it was and things like that and occasionally raided it and so forth. But the fact of the matter is they, they worshipped either in very, very, very large homes or they worshipped in their own buildings. The idea that, that those very, very, very large homes, for example, would have contained pagan imagery, which was popular back then, is a thoroughly rational way of looking at the admonitions by councils or bishops, whoever, not to have that kind of imagery. See, it's, it's not enough to say that imagery you shouldn't have. What imagery did they have? We don't know what they were talking about, but we do know that there are those that said during that time that many of the buildings that were either appropriated for Christian use or so forth had to be uh, changed because they had 
pagan religious imagery in them. So it's not a stretch to think that when someone is complaining about imagery in the local Christian temple, uh, church, whatever you want to call it, um, that the imagery being referred to may have been inappropriate pagan imagery that was already there. I'm just suggesting that that's plausible. Uh, uh, Father Jonathan, I just want to know who gets the final say on what councils are uh, good or bad or, or anything like that. I mean, it, it, it seems like special, you know, special pleading when when I hear that, because, I mean, Nicaea, too, I mean, that was didn't have as many bishops and stuff as Hyria in 754. And they backed the on iconoclast tradition. And Nicaea, too, didn't even have argued by Richard Price, uh, who is a uh, Catholic uh, historian, uh, representation from Antioch, Alexandria, or Jerusalem. What do you, who gets to say which council is significant or insignificant? Well, David, l l let me help you answer your own question. It didn't have any representation from Alexandria, uh, Antioch, or Jerusalem. In what empire did those three apostolic sees find themselves in the 8th century? In the East. No. Right? In, what, in what empire? Governed by who? I would say is we're looking at the Roman Empire, right? No. In the 8th century, in actually eighth, going back to the 7th century, those three apostolic sees were... They were... No. <laughs> Islam had conquered that territory already. So the idea that any of those bishops could have traveled freely to the center of the hated Roman Empire, hated by Islam. Let's remember that from very early years, they wanted to conquer Constantinople and tried and tried and tried until they finally did 700 years later. All right. So they to say, well, there was no representation really translates. I keep talking about context. They couldn't leave. They were like in a prison. And the idea that they would have been given guaranteed safe transportation to the heart of the Roman Empire was something that just wasn't going to be happening back then. Okay, let, let's, let's understand that. As far as what makes an ecumenical council ecumenical, ecumenical councils determine what councils are ecumenical. So as we move from one council to the next, what usually happens is the preceding minutes and all the declarations of whatever happened, they are repeated and they are reaffirmed in the next one. And usually it takes a long time for an ecumenical council to be recognized as ecumenical. It's not like they get together and go, oh, okay, we're convening an ecumenical council. This is really cool. That's not how it works and that's not how it happened. Chalcedon wasn't really affirmed, and even then, uh, not by everybody, for 100 years, over 100 years. And it wasn't until the fifth council that they recognized the fourth Chalcedon as ecumenical. And we know the, the history behind that. So in answer to the question, in direct answer to your question, it's an ecumenical council that determines what previous councils are ecumenical. The ecumenical council in orthodoxy and the canons it produces are, outside of scripture, the highest authority for church governance that you have. Pastor Sam, you have anything on that? Well, just to, to mention that um, when you see the Synod of Elvira, it was in 305 or 306 AD. Constantine wasn't um, a Christian yet, and it takes an emperor, right, to hold an ecumenical council. So there was no way for it to even be an ecumenical council. There was no emperor to make it, if you go by the, the rules of what people say of how to make an ecumenical council. So I, I don't think it should be something that should be just pushed aside. These were 19 bishops that saw something, talked about it. And in fact, they didn't mention it was pagan images that were not to be in churches. They said pictures in general. I mean, it was it was very clear. It, was, it didn't say it was pagan images. So we well, can tell from that. It to be that. We don't know if that's exactly what they meant. Because obviously elsewhere there were images. So again, we don't know the context of what they said or why they said it. What well, was the problem that came up? Just to, just to clarify, they were saying images in churches. So they weren't they weren't saying all images were bad. They were saying images general in churches. They gave a location and they gave no qualifier for the images. So to me, at least, I think it's clear. But you know, I understand we have different opinions, and that may not be clear for you. But for for me, at least, 
That, that's a clear statement for me. Oh, it's very clear. But again, Elvira plays very little, uh, has very little precedence in the Orthodox Church in terms of any determination uh, of this nature that we're talking about for iconography and so forth. All right. Can, right I, on. can I just ask a very quick follow up if it's okay? Yeah, yeah, just, absolutely. Sorry. Nope. To, no, no. What I'm saying is we're so trying we're to confuse you as we, best we can. Yeah. Yeah. You we're, guys have a list. So I, okay. I'll wait till the end. And no, no, no. Go, Dale, go ahead. Uh, I just want to kind of, you know, bring everybody. I mean, everybody's up to speed, but we're at the two hour mark. Um, and uh, we still got, I think, four <laughs> questions to go. And so, yeah, Dale, go ahead. Um, let's let's do this. So, Dale, ask your who's your question for it? Bill. for father jonathan you can literally give a yes or no answer if you want but so let's uh, do that let's let's give the question to father jonathan jonathan can answer pastor sam can respond and then i'll ask the next question on the list how about that okay cool yes yeah, so okay. just very out of curiosity are there any examples in history of a non-eucumenical council affirming a previous non-eucumenical council and is there any examples of that in history or of a non-ecumenical council approving, um, no, no. Okay, okay, cool. That was it. Any follow up, uh, Pastor Sam? No, that was just a very good question. That's pretty, pretty on point. I'm just interested because I don't know. Yeah, no, that was good enough. Okay. All right. Uh, so Father Jonathan, so the next question, uh, number four on the list, and I'm going to actually add a um an audience question into this because I mean, the two go hand in hand. Um, let me find that real quick. I will make my answer brief for this one. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. Uh, let's see. Let me find his question. I'm not trying to have that. Here we go. Okay. So the question is, uh, why do Orthodox Christians venerate icons? And then the second part of that question, can you define veneration? Can I define veneration? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll, I'll try. Uh, to do so, let me give a, a, a quick story. So, so bear with me. I, I promise to make it quick. In World War II, my grandfather kept by his bedside a photo of my uncle. He had three children and, and a photo of my uncle, uh, Bob, who was in the Navy at the time in the Pacific. Um, he kept the picture of Uncle Bob right by his bedside. And my mother said at night he would pick the picture up. He would speak to it. He would talk to it, and uh, he would make the sign of the cross over it, and he would kiss my Uncle Bob on the cheek as if, you know, he was giving a kiss to Uncle Bob was there. And my mother was very struck by that. When I heard the story, I was very struck by that, and I thought, you know, that's exactly how we treat icons. I, I think if you were to have asked my grandfather, what are you kissing? He would not have said, I'm kissing a picture. Mm -hmm. He thought the kiss that he was giving, the love that he was giving through that kiss, the dialogue that he was giving, even though Uncle Bob couldn't hear, he was talking to that photo as if Uncle Bob could hear, and probably my grandfather wished could hear. And I think that's very much the kind of, of, of way in which we venerate icons. We, we hold them as something dear and precious, as if they are the photos of our loved ones who are not here with us right now, but present somehow in another context, um, in another place, uh, in, in their in their place, heaven. Yeah. So I think when I think of that story of my grandfather and, and my uncle Bob, I think that's exactly how orthodoxy looks at icons as, as pictures that um, remind us of our love for the saints, our love for Christ, our love for Mary, our love for, for whoever. And it, it makes their presence real, just like the photograph of my uncle Bob made his presence real to my grandfather. And when we kiss them, and sometimes we might even talk to them, we know we're, we're not talking to a picture. We're not kissing a picture. We're kissing what it represents. Story over. I see a lot of people do that at the graveyard. You know what I mean? It, I mean, sure. granted, they kiss that there's, the headstone. No, mm -hmm, there's no they picture. Kiss the headstone. You know, are they kissing the dead? You know, or what are they doing? Right. So, Practicing necromancy? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. I've, right. actually, I've actually had the experience of, uh, of being at a funeral and seeing somebody... Um, you know, like, let's say like hug the casket. It's the closest that they can get. You know what I mean? Like, or, or hug the gravestone over the grave and shed tears yeah. and have yeah. what is actually a monologue. But in, in, in terms of this, the, the thought life, the subjective experience, something more like a remembrance dialogue with the person that they're trying to have this, you know, lost communion with. Um, and, and I think that when, 
when we have something like a gravestone, it is m performing much the same function, let's say emotionally or psychologically. I think it is performing the same function. When you go to a grave site, it's a particular location, and you have a, a gravestone. It's, it's, it's very similar to an altar. And you're going there for the explicit purpose of remembrance and participation in the memory that you have of that person in your time together or whatever. Um, and I think that those things are, let's say, akin enough that I think I understand what you mean by veneration versus because I've never seen anybody like you said. I've literally never seen anybody worship a gravestone. Yeah. And and that is a good good expounding on, on the theme of veneration. No one is worshiping the gravestone. No one's worshiping anything. They're, they're just treating with honor, dignity and respect and perhaps love that thing which represents their departed loved one. Yeah. Pastor Sam, I want your follow up, but first let me uh, tell our audience we've got some questions coming in, guys. Some pretty good questions. Uh, but please let us know who your question is for if you're addressing it specifically to Father Jonathan or Pastor Sam. If you could put that in the question as well, that would be extremely helpful. But we'll try to figure out and uh, and and follow Father Jonathan's advice and in use context to try to determine who the question is for. So with that being said, Pastor Sam, uh, go ahead and uh, with your follow up. And then, guys, I'll ask the next question since it's kind of long. Uh, I don't want you all to have to read that whole thing. And then we'll jump back to going around. So, uh, Pastor Sam. So the question of why do Orthodox Christian venerate icons? I would say the answer is because it's, it's mandatory. So you look at yeah. the Ecumenical Council of um, the Seventh Ecumenical Council in 787, this is not an optional practice. I think this is the, the thing that we, we need to really discuss here. There were anathemas placed at that council, um, and this is just a sampling of it. Anathema to those who apply the words of scripture which are spoken against the idols to venerate images. So I'm, I'm anathema from, from right there. And I have other anathemas too, but anathema to those who do not salute the holy and venerable images. So basically anybody listening here, has to understand, if you are not practicing venerating icons, you are under anathema. That is what the Ecumenical Council says, and it's considered infallible. It's at the same level as Scripture. It's infallible, and that is what's being said here. Anathema to those who say Christians have recourse to the images as to the gods. Anathema to those who call the sacred images idols. Anathema to those who knowingly communicate with those who revile and dishonor the venerable images. So even communication with somebody who dishonors um, images, it, you have an anathema there. And we need a lot of people have tried to water down what an anathema means. And I'm not speaking for my opponent. I'll let him speak about what an anathema means. But based on what it means in, 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 in Greek, it means cursed by God to hell. Now, that does not mean that once you're under anathema, you, you are definitely going to hell you do have a chance to repent before you draw your last breath. But what is being said here is that you must repent to the church because what you're, you have to be, the, the Orthodox church believes that they hold the keys to salvation. They are the Ark of Salvation. Anyone who's not in the church is outside the Ark of Salvation. When you have this anathema on your head, you have to repent and basically be part of this church or you're under anathema. And just to clarify that this is the definition, uh, John Maximov, uh, who's an Orthodox saint, says this as he defines an anathema, which is historically accurate. It says, In the Acts of the Councils and the further course of the New Testament Church of Christ, the word anathema came to mean complete separation from the church. The Catholic and Apostolic Church, which is referring to the Orthodox Church here, anathematizes. Let him be anathema, let it be anathema, means the complete tearing away from the church. While in cases of separation from the communion of the church and other epitomum or penances laid on the person, the person remains a member of the church, even though his participation in his in her grace-filled life was limited. Those given over to anathema were thus completely torn away until their repentance. That's sort of showing that you must repent. Realizing she, this is the Eastern Orthodox Church, is unable to do anything for their salvation in view of their stubbornness and hardness of heart. So if you're not venerating icons, you are stubborn with a hardness of heart. This is the language being used. The earthly church lifts them up to the judgment of God. The judgment is merciful unto repentant sinners, but fearsome to stubborn enemies of God. If you don't venerate icons, you are a stubborn enemy of God. It is a frightful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, for our God is a consuming fire. Anathema is not final damnation until death, until death repentance is possible. 
Anathema is fearsome not because of the church wishes anyone evil, anyone evil, or God seeks their damnation, their desire that all be saved. But it is fearsome to stand before the presence of God in a state of hardened evil. Nothing is hidden from him. So again, you're standing in a state of hardened evil by not practicing the veneration of icons. And again, this is the definition of what an icon is, and that was the authorial intent of those who put together the anathemas at the Seventh Ecumenical Council. And if you look, it's only until the 19th century that members of the Orthodox Church, not saying the official church, but members in the Orthodox Church started to water down what an anathema means. But the church itself has never reversed what it says, and it can't because another part of the doctrine of the Orthodox Church is that the church cannot err. They cannot make a mistake, and especially in an ecumenical council where it's considered infallible, including those anathemas. However, despite these claims, Galatians 1, 8, through nine actually tells us where the true anathema is on. It says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. That's the anathema. As we said before, we now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Anathema. So it's those who add to the gospel message. When again, context is is key. We've been talking about this in this debate. Paul here is writing to the Judaizers. They didn't say what Paul said was wrong. All they said was, well, you have to do circumcision and add other requirements. But he said, by simply adding to the gospel, that means that you are cursed by God to hell. That's that's the, where the true anathema is there. And then the other problem is the Seventh Ecumenical Council is considered a council that was infallibly inspired by the Holy Spirit. But if you actually pay attention to the details, you'll see that they display poor hermeneutics. Here's an example of how they twist scripture. It says, it is written, thy face, O Lord, do I seek. That's from Psalm 27, 8. And likewise, the rich of the people will pray or supplicate your continence. That's from Psalm 45, 12. Now go ahead and read those in context. Read the whole Psalms in context. And this is what they say. But the images are the face and continence of God. Therefore, the images are to be adorned with prayers and supplication. That, that's, that's poor hermeneutics. That's not what those mean. And another problem was, again, forged documents and, and misattributions of quotes. This is a quote that's attributed to Basil and is falsely attributed to him. He says, I acknowledge also the holy apostles, prophets, and martyrs, and I invoke them to supplication to God, that through them, that is through their meditation, and the merciful God may be propitious to me, and that a ransom may be made and given to me for my sins. Therefore, who also I honor and kiss and the features of their images in so much as they have been, been handed down from the holy apostles and are not forbidden, but are in all our churches. Again, this was not a, a statement that Basil said, but it was used as ammunition. And again, the, the popular one that actually is uh, something that um, Basil said, the honor given to the image passes directly to the prototype. Read that in context. He's not talking about uh, the, the physical worship of image. He's not talking about anything done in a liturgy. He's actually talking and making an argument about the Trinity. So th the reason that the Orthodox Church has to and has no choice is because if they don't, they're under anathema. Father Jonathan, would you like to respond? A couple observations. Number one, when the church holds an ecumenical council, it is talking about what the people in the Orthodox Church have to do and believe and so forth. The anathemas were being hurled. I always think of anathema hurling as a Orthodox Olympic sport, you know, you know <laughs> cannon tossing and anathema hurling and things like that. Um, what it was saying is that you can't be Orthodox and believe these things. That, that's anathema. But again, let even deeper than context, let's talk about what is behind and motivating everything in the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Iconography, uh, all of the ecumenical councils, let me make this observation. All of the ecumenical councils, every single one, in some way, shape, or form, dealt with the Christology of the church, dealt with Christology, beginning with Nicaea, going through uh, Constantinople I and Chalcedon and, and so forth and so on. All of them dealt with Christology. And the seventh dealt with it in the sense that 
if Jesus Christ had not been incarnated, then you can't represent him. It's as simple as that. In John 1, um, no one has ever seen God, but you know, we who spent time with Jesus, we saw him, we spoke to him, we ate with him, we spent time with him, we touched him, we know he's real. And therefore, because God took flesh, we can depict him. We can't depict the Father, nobody's ever seen him. Can't depict the Spirit, no one's ever seen him. But we've seen Jesus. And uh, because we've seen Jesus, because he was incarnate in the flesh, therefore he can be depicted. And so iconoclasts were people who were saying, no, you can't. That's wrong, can't do that. And we were saying, no, you're wrong. He took flesh, he was seen. And therefore, because of the incarnation, which we affirm, because of the incarnation, Christ can be depicted iconographically. And anybody who says you can't do that is an iconoclast and is denying the incarnation. It's that so, simple. I mean, that's the core that it all comes down to, the incarnation of whether Christ was real and whether we can really then depict him. So I feel like that 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 kind of statement is, is in some sense, re relevant, but also like analogous to the, the question of why it is that we don't continue to observe the Sabbath is that Christ was what the Sabbath was, let's say, corralling us in and pointing us forward to as the ultimate rest in Christ. We don't we don't celebrate or, or observe the Sabbath in the same way because no, now no, no. We, we still observe the Sabbath, the but we observe Sunday as the new Sabbath of Christ's resurrection, giving new life to the world. We still observe the Sabbath. So then in the same sense, are you saying that in the New Testament, because of Christ, there's a shift in the ability to represent uh, things like the way that, that we represent uh, uh, Christ, who is God, but we can have a an icon of Christ. And that's not a graven image, like, a, a, a let's say, a violation of the second commandment. You're saying that's also because of Christ. Yes, I'm saying that. Okay. All right. Let us... Uh... Let's go to the next question. Uh, we still got a few more to get to, and we got some audience questions to get to. Uh, so, Pastor Samuel, I have a quote here from the book, The Orthodox Church, An Introduction to Its History, Doctrine, and Spiritual Care by Father John Anthony McGuckin that I would like to ask you about. So the quote is, and bear with me, it's kind of long. No uh, so, quote, for the Orthodox, the icon is a sacred sacramental means of evoking the presence of the Lord or the Virgin or the saint that it depicts. It is a holy thing charged with a powerful blessing to assist the believer who prays for it in order to act as a medium of that presence which the believer desires to be in, be it that of Christ, the Virgin, or the saint. Orthodox believers come before an icon and make the sign of the cross over themselves and bow down in reverence. This is not some form of magical worship of an idol. Many Protestants may feel this so deeply because it is an experience of worship utterly alien to them, and thus perhaps a prejudice hard to get over. The Orthodox are not so dim in their faith to mistake bowing down for a dumb idol for the veneration of Christ. When the Orthodox come before an icon of Christ, let us say they bow down before it so that they can express their heart's devotion to the Lord himself. The fundamental theological principle of Orthodox veneration, therefore, is that which St. Basil the Great enunciated in the 4th century. Quote, the honor given to the image passes over directly to the prototype. End quote. In other words, when an Orthodox venerates an icon, they never worship an icon. They bow down not to the image, but to Christ himself, who is represented in the image. To the Virgin and Saints is given profound reverence, dulia, because of their closeness to God, and because of the way they have been assimilated so closely with Christ's glory. To venerate the Virgin and the saints is, the Orthodox believe, another form of giving glory to Christ. But even so, there is a very big difference between veneration and worship and adoration. If Christians of the Reformed tradition could trust that Orthodox know what they mean and know what they are doing when they venerate icons, much suspicion could be ecumenically avoided. End quote. My first question is, and, and I, I know we've touched on this earlier, and so you, you had said that you would uh, expound uh, more on this subject whenever we got to this question. But my first question is, do you recognize the distinction Orthodox laity and clergy make between veneration dulia and worship latreia? And my second question is, what are your overall thoughts about the above quote? 
So, yeah, I understand the Orthodox laity and clergy distinction between veneration dulia and worship latria. Again, I, I practiced this for 32 years of my life, so sure. I lived it I, um, and um, I experienced it. Yeah. Uh, they claim latria is only for God and is, is the true worship uh, oh. regarding dulia. It can be for God, but it is uh, because he is both worshipped and venerated. However, Mary and the saints only receive dulia. And um, my opponent has has explained the Orthodox um, uh, stance uh, on, on what they believe. He expressed it well of what they believe. Um, yeah, we need to consider how does scripture use the word dulia? And how do, so let's look at the New Testament and actually look at this quote from a New Testament scholar, James Dunn. He says, dulia occurs only in the sense of slavery, severity, and always in a negative sense. The slavery to physical corruption, Romans 8.21, slavery to the law, Galatians 5.1, and slavery to the fear of death, Hebrews 2.15. So let's look at those scriptures real quick. Romans 8.15, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery, dulia, to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Romans 8.21, that the creation itself will be free but we set free from the bondage, dulia, to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Galatians 5.1, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery, dulia. Hebrews 2.15, and deliver all these who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Again, dulia. I think the word that we really need to focus on is, is proskuneia. I know we've been talking about it already. Um, so, so, but I think that's where you'll see that when they're actually talking about worship um, or, or any type of veneration, that's the word that's actually often being used in scripture. And again, if you look at Latria, Latria is also not used extensively in scripture. It's used five times in, in the New Testament. And the definition of Latria from the, the Thyre Greek lexicon is one, any service or ministration, the service of God, two, the service and worship of God according to the requirements of Levitical law, and three, to perform sacred services. So when you're looking at how Latria and Dulia are used in scripture, they're not really making this distinction or this argument that the Orthodox Church is doing. And I think our focus really should be on proskuneia on how that is being used. So that's the answer to the first question. To, to the next one about responding to the quote directly, there were two points, actually three points. One was the Basel quote, which we already talked about, but two other things that were said in the quote that caught my attention that I want to respond to. He says, uh, the author says, this is not some form of magical worship of an idol. Many Protestants may feel this so deeply because it is an experience of worship utterly alien to them, and thus perhaps a prejudice hard to get over. The Orthodox are not so dim in their faith as to mistake bowing down before a dumb idol for the veneration of Christ. And the other one uh, that he said, if Christians of the Reformed tradition could trust that Orthodox knew, know what they mean, and know what they are doing when they venerate icons, much suspicion could be ecumenically avoided. And, and I would say that's not true at all. I spent 32 years of my life, which is most of it, in the Orthodox Church. And in fact, my parents didn't even name me. I'm actually named by a monk. Uh, multiple Orthodox priests uh, thought that it was my destiny to be a priest. And that was told to me as I was growing up constantly. I had an Orthodox pharonima which if you read the book Orthodox Thinking, I would recommend it. If you're going to be discussing things with Orthodoxy, go read that book. And even there, the author makes the claim that even though Oriental and Eastern are separated, she had met a Coptic woman who had an Orthodox pharonima. So they claim that this is something that could be shared within the Oriental and the Eastern, uh, is what the author says. And again, my brother and I served as readers in the church. So that's like altar boys in the, in the Roman Catholic church. My dad served as a deacon or a deacon in the church. I served as a Sunday school teacher in multiple Orthodox churches. My family hosted a myriad of priests, bishops, and monks at their home. We had countless church services at our home. And in fact, when a local church was being uh, built in the area as a church plant, they would contain the altar items in my parents' home. My aunt is the one who makes the fabric that goes on the relics. My family has been gifted, not body part relics, but relics of, of clothing of certain people that were considered saints. I took a course in the Orthodox Church that would count as, as seminary credit if I chose to go that route. 
I wrote homilies and messages on the lives of the saints uh, for my local priest. And he would use those in his sermons and when visiting people in the congregation. And I even considered studying the making of icons because I have an art background. I love graphic design. So I love the idea of icons. I even consider, uh, so really with all this that I'm saying, I could say that I was an Orthodox of Orthodox in a lot of ways. But all these accomplishments, all the status and network and the people I was a part of, all of it is rubbish compared to the prize of Christ. To boast about my past orthodoxy is to speak in a very earthly way. And I think the author here with his quote is also speaking in a very earthly way. I'm not someone who's on the outside looking in. I was fully immersed in the life of the Orthodox Church. But now, as a born-again believer, and I believe saved from an apostate church, I can say that Protestants who are familiar with the subject, pe people who have studied it, they reject the claims of the Orthodox Church based on valid reasons, so they should not be treated with disrespect. There are people like Gavin Ortland or Joshua Shuping who have done work and challenged the Orthodox Church, but many people dismiss them and throw them aside, claiming, oh, they're just Protestants or Westerners. It's disrespectful. Protestants don't have a prejudice that's too hard to get over. We don't have unfounded suspicions. We actually have very legitimate challenges that we are presenting that we would like to hear an answer for and have dialed. And I want to just say this discussion so far, I know it's been emotional in some parts, but it's been a very productive, good discussion. I want to thank everyone involved. It's been a very good discussion. I think more of this is desperately needed because so much is on the line here with this. On both sides, we see it as very important things. Mm -hmm. So the way when we look at it, what the Orthodox Church is, is, is claiming, I see this as they are holding to sola ecclesia, which is the church alone. See, the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Oriental and the Roman Catholic Church, they believe in this, just this one sola. And I would say I come to this conclusion because of the claims that they make. An infallible apostolic church, infallible holy tradition, infallible ecumenical councils that they hold to, an infallible interpretation of the scriptures, and an infallible consensus of the church fathers. So based on what these are really orthodox dogmas, is that you, one is saved by the church alone, through the church alone, in the church alone, according to the church alone, all for the glory of the church alone. Yet Protestants see scripture as the only true and infallible and inerrant standard of authority, and that's why we stand on the five solas, because we base that off the word of God that one is saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to scripture alone, all for the glory of God alone. Father Jonathan, do you have any follow-up? Father McGuckin's quote is very clear. I'm not sure how I can expand on that. For someone who says everything he went through was not important, pastor certainly spent a lot of time talking about himself. But pastor, you were very much involved in a lot of externals of the faith and never really understood the faith to begin with. If you had, you never would have left it. Now, I can't speak for the Coptic church. I know there are things about the Coptic church that the Orthodox church is concerned about, which is why we are not in communion. The, Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox church and the Oriental Orthodox communion, we are not in communion with each other. However, um, I, I want to ask you if you can clarify something. Did I hear you say that you left an apostate church? Absolutely. That? Okay. And, and I think that's the thing is why, why can it be that I understand the position and, and, and I don't accept it? Just like you may understand what I'm saying and not accept it. Why does it have to be clearly you didn't understand or like some people claim you weren't catechized or you weren't this? Why can it be simply I have heard what was said. I understand. I can I can understand what's being said, and I reject it because I don't see that it's true. And well, likewise, when I say something, you actually understand what I'm saying. But for me to say, "Oh, well, you don't understand because you were never you're not Protestant or you're not Western or you're not this," uh, that's that's disrespectful for me to say that to you. Well, so I, why, I, why do it to other people actually, on the other end? I, I actually spent time in the Reformed Church in my high school and college years. I was a member of Campus Crusade for Christ and Inner Varsity. I left them for a reason, which I'm not going to go into here. But the point uh, of, of Father McGuckin's um, quote is very interesting to me because what he's basically saying is, and this is how I read it, Protestants, please believe us when we say 
We are not worshiping icons. Take our word for it. And if you take our word for it, we'll have a much better time engaging with one another rather than engaging in uh, uh, invective and so forth. And, and I think that that appeal in his in the quote that that was read earlier uh, is a valid appeal. I, I I am firmly convinced the Protestant world, the evangelical world, sees us in a light which is not um, uh, fair or true. And in the many times I've had discussions with Protestants, I find that they have straw man arguments, uh, red herring arguments. There, there's just a lot of things that are said that are not true, and that's the problem. Uh, I'm glad to see in in this debate this evening we found a couple things that we believe in, um, but I think at the end of the day here neither of us is going to change our opinion about the other the other's position. And the problem with that to me is that either we believe in truth or we don't. Either there is a truth out there, there is a subjective truth, an objective truth out there that trumps everything. And when you talk about some of the things that Protestants and, and Orthodox disagree on, we both can't be right. But I truly also believe we both can't be wrong, because if we claim to have the spirit of God, the only other option is I'm right and you're wrong or you're right and I'm wrong. And we don't seem to be able to explore that in the kind of depth that would result in a, a, a decision being made that, hey, you know what? You are right and I'm wrong. I'm going to change my mind on that. And that's the unfortunate thing about much of the internet debate. I'm not blaming you, by the way. I'm, I'm just blaming the format and things like no, that. Understood, yeah. But I, I wish we could have more sincere, serious, in-depth debate. I hope that maybe this evening provided some of that. That's what we strive for here at Faith and Altar. Yes, just for, I understand. Just, just yeah. for anybody you know that's listening, and, and I think you guys have demonstrated that um, more than a lot of people that have come on our show, um, like I said, we try to strive for that and you guys have been excellent in doing that. It's been a very charitable conversation, heated, passionate, which, mm -hmm. which we all agree on, um, and, and is, is good. Right. But at the end of the day, you guys are being extremely respectful to each other. And I thank you both for that. So, um, does anyone and can know? I say one, one more thing here is that, uh, you know, I, I've been so enamored with the discussion. I think both of you guys have presented uh something that i think is truly lacking i think both of you've done this um is historical context is is a big deal as well and you know um we might understand the historical context in some areas and we might not in other areas we need to take a look into it so i think you've provided that uh very well very well and even even to our own shortcomings that yeah we do we do miss it sometimes. We miss that context. Um, I think that's very, very powerful. And I think that um, there's sometimes that we we do miss it. So, but you guys, like I said, done very good. And I think you guys did very good in in your discussion. And I praise you both for putting together a very informative and wonderful dialogue. So you guys have both represented your positions well. Let me let, let's do this, guys. We're at the two hour and 30 mark. We still got a couple audience questions. I went through them and kind of weeded out the ones that either didn't apply to this or was more preaching than than question asking. So let's do this. We've got three. Uh, let's see, four questions left. And I know that you guys have prepped for each one of them. So we've got a couple options. We can power through all of these questions. Um, we can. If you guys want to do that, I'm fine with doing that. Uh, I can stay as long as, as you guys do. The second option is if you guys want to choose, both of you choose one of the questions that are left on here for, for you guys uh, that you're just dying to answer, if there is one, um, whether it's uh, question six, seven, eight, or nine. And then we can get to the audience questions. Um, what, what would you guys rather do? Well, I'll say from my end, I'm, I'm free, so I don't mind if we okay. want to continue going, that's fine. But if... If there's schedule conflicts of anyone, we can also just uh, go that route. But for me, at least, I'm I'm fine. Father Jonathan, I'd I'd be actually desirous at this point to find out what the audience is asking. Okay, all right, okay. Uh, David, Dell, Josh, you guys want to weigh in on that or? 
I think it would be, I I think it would be expedient, even if we didn't get to all of the questions to um, perhaps forward the invitation to even create a part two for this discussion, because this has been really fruitful. People seem to be really engaged. Uh, Everybody's interested. Uh, It's important topic. And like you guys had already said, David said these, you guys have been so well prepared. Uh, This has been really fantastic. Uh, and so I'm I'm really enjoying the exchange, and I would not mind having more of it. Yeah. Okay, so let's do this. Um, if you guys want to, um, I, there, there's one more question on this list that I really want to ask um, because it it has to do with Mary, and and I'm studying Mary right now. So if we want, I can ask that question uh, to Father Jonathan. And then, Sam, if you want me to ask you a question, just tell me which one it is, and then we can get to the audience questions, if that's okay, okay with everyone. Okay. So my my question, then, is number six uh, on the list. Uh, I've recently come to the understanding that there is a third category, a middle, so to say, between dulia and latria, namely hyperdulia. That is veneration given specifically to Mary. So kind of a three-part question here. What is the difference between dulia and hyperdulia in practice? Why is Mary set apart from all the other saints and semantically, i.e. in word, and if we aren't exceptionally careful, practically, i.e. indeed, isn't this concept getting close to what we would find in Latria? Ready, set, go? Go for it. Okay. Um, I've read... Uh, I've read similar things. The, these things, these three distinctions do not, I believe, come from ecumenical councils or the consensus of the church fathers. If anything, the notion of hyperdulia uh, may simply represent uh, the kind of extra enthusiasm the faithful have for their mother. Hmm. Uh, so if, if I wanted to call hyperdulia something, I would just call it an enthusiastic dulia an enthusiastic veneration. Why? Because she's the mother of our God. She gave birth to God, the word. And if we, if we don't believe in a capricious God, if we believe in a God that does everything for a purpose and a reason, you know, Jesus said, I, everything I do and say, I say and do because my father told me to say and do it. So if we believe not in a capricious God, but a God that does everything in, in, with purpose and intent and things like that, then he chose Mary for a reason. And if that's the case, then she is special. All generations will call me, will call me blessed. So in in the church, there aren't, these aren't really different categories, but these are just distinctions. The fathers of the seventh ecumenical council made a very clear distinction between latria, which is the worship of God and God alone, dulia or proskenesis, um, which is the honor we give to the saints and to, to holy objects, by the way. So hyperdulia for the mother of God, you know, I mean, it, it's a word that can work, I guess. But without these distinctions, those outside the church would think uh, we worship the Theotokos when we say, most holy Theotokos, save us, uh, for example. Uh, this, uh, th- th- this was something that was addressed, that was attempted to address the main problem in iconoclasm. So what does it mean to worship, to adore, to honor God or Mary or the saints? And how do you distinguish without falling into idolatry? How should we understand what I just said? Most holy Theotoko save us. In the ancient world, worship clearly involved the distinct action of offering sacrifices in a ritual manner that any ancient person would recognize. Anyone in the ancient world understood that Christians clearly weren't worshiping saints and the Theotokos because they were never offering ritual sacrifice. Now, in our day and age, the very definition of worship has seemed to change because the Protestant evangelical world, to them, what worship is has changed. Um, you know, and, and when you look at what it means by offering incense, for example, because this is a closely related issue, it's not difficult to understand why the heterodox can be scandalized by many of our worship practices because their definition of worship has changed. So um, I, I, I think we're dealing with distinctions of of veneration distinctions of the enthusiasm one brings to one saint versus another saint you go to thessalonica there's a very deep and distinct devotion to saint demetrius whose relics by the way miraculously exude 
a sweet smelling myrrh quite often. Mm. It, it's a phenomenon that, that continues to this day. So the, the idea that we would venerate holy things, whether an object or a piece of the cross or, or the relic of a saint or a place where someone was martyred, um, these things are very special to us and we offer them uh, veneration. But when it comes to the mother of God, there's a little bit more taking place there because she is a little bit more. There's nothing that, that places her on the same level as any other saint in the church because she is the mother of God, the word. And she was chosen by the father specifically to bear his son. And because of that, uh, we think that there's an, an extra special veneration that is due to her. Before I get Sam's uh, follow-up, uh, just, just a quick question since you brought up uh, Mary and, and Holy Theotokos save us. I've read in, in, in the scriptures now in 1 Corinthians 9.22... And I think it's Romans, it's either 14, 11 or 11, 14, but Paul uses that same language so that I may save some, right? Is that the same kind of thing that whenever the Orthodox, um, not attribute salvation to Mary is not the right word. Um, but, but whenever they say things like save us, you know, Holy Theotokos, yeah, yeah. is Paul saying the something similar in scripture He's saying exactly the same thing. Okay, when exactly the same. Say, when people criticize the Orthodox for saying, most holy Theotokos save us, only God can save us. Well, in, in Greek, the word sosonimas, save us, soson, is yeah. the same word Peter used when he was falling into the Sea of Galilee. And he said, o kyrios soson me, mm -hmm. Lord, save me. He wasn't saying at that point in time, Lord, please offer me eternal salvation. That was the last thing on his mind at that point in time, I can guarantee you. Because the word to save means to deliver. Hmm. It does not mean to bring salvation. Now, you can quote, uh, you can probably find some quote where it says that. But again, you'd have to go back to the Greek and you'd have to go back to context. A lot of our English is very imprecise. Look at the word for love. We've translated four different forms of love in the New Testament into one word into English, and we lose the distinctions between the four. So we have to be very careful about what we're saying in the context, as I've been saying for the last two and a half hours. And the word save does not mean to bring salvation. It means to deliver. So when we say, Most Holy Theotokos, save us, we're saying, Most Holy Theotokos, you who have the ear of your son because you stand at his right hand, ask him to deliver us, ask him to save us, ask him to protect us, whatever. Because it is the word of a mother that has great effect on her son and the imagery of the queen who stood at thy right hand arrayed in golden robes all glorious. The ancient symbol of the divine council with the king surrounded by his mother on the right. The queen was not his wife. They had many queens back then. The queen was the queen mother. That's who stood at the right hand of, of Pharaoh or the king or whoever it was. And when Jesus said to James and John, after they asked him if they could sit at his right and his left, he said, no, those places have already been assigned. And we believe in the Orthodox Church. That's shown in the deus icon. Mary is on his right. John the Baptist is on his left. Interesting. Pastor Sam, floor is yours. So uh, the way I, uh, something that we should remember is that anything that's officially recited in the divine liturgy is considered infallible. It doesn't mean if you just say something, but something that's officially done, like a, a hymn, for example, is considered infallible if it's in the divine liturgy. So we should look at some of these hymns and see, is this really hyperbole about Mary or is this something else? So there's the Akatha hymn to the Most Holy Theotokos. This is sung during the Great Lent. These are some of the things that it says in this hymn. She is the propitiation of the whole world. She is the restoration of men. She is the forgiveness for many who have stumbled. Through thee our sin is remitted. She is the ship of all who would be saved. She is the gate of salvation. She is the provider of God's mercy. Through thee, through thou hast given new birth to those conceived in shame. She is the beginning of a new and spiritual creation. She joineth in union the faithful to their Lord. She taketh away the filth of sin, and she is the salvation of my soul. Now you look at another hymn, the entry of the Most Holy Theotokos into the temple. 
Not, this is something that we must realize that in the Eastern Orthodox Church, they actually believed that Mary was living in the Holy of Holies. Now, there are a lot of theological problems with that and how that's possible. But if you look for the record of where that came from, it comes from the Apocrypha book, the Provangelion of James. And that's where these ideas, and we can get into another debate about the propitiation, the, uh, her perpetual virginity, but those are also found, that's where they find their origins in it. Anyways, they have this hymn of Mary being in the temple, and this is the things that are, again, said in this hymn. She is the acceptable sacrifice, the ebb lamb of God without spot, the dove without blemish. She is a child in the flesh, but perfect in soul. She possesses a body that was never subject to the taint of sin. I mean, these are major theological problems. Through thee, we are reconciled with God. The law prefigured thee most wonderfully as a tabernacle, jar of man, a strange Ark, veil of the temple, rod of Aaron, temple never to be destroyed, the gate of God, and is, and so it teaches us to cry to thee, O pure virgin, thou art truly high above all. Again, it seems like they're speaking to God here. She is the restoration of all who would dwell on the earth through though through thee we are reconciled to God. She who made the light of grace shine forth, the Theotokos has illuminated all men and brought them together to adorn with songs of her most triumphant victory. And there's another phrase, grant to my soul, O Theotokos, the calm peace that comes from thy gifts of grace. Thou art the foundation of life unto those that honor thee. All is due. Thou dost surrender, protect, and preserve us that we may cry aloud to thee, O pure virgin, thou art truly high above all. Another hymn, the birth of the Holy Mother Lady, the Theotokos. This is actually the first feast in the Eastern Orthodox calendar. And it says, she is the salvation of men. And by her, the her here is referencing Mary's mother, Anna, birth giving, she overthrows the curse of Adam. O undefiled maiden, through thee we have been delivered from corruption. O Mary, thou has released Eve from the ancestral curse. Thou art our deliverer from the sharp punishment of old, the restoration of Mother Eve, the cause of reconciliation of our kind to God, the bridge that leads us to the Maker. Thee, then, O Theotokos, do we magnify that through her we have been made godlike and delivered from death. She is a haven of salvation, and Christians are absolved of sin by her thy supplication. Now, the next hymn is from the Dormition of the Most Holy Theotokos and Ever Virgin. This is the last of the major feasts in the Eastern Orthodox Church. So you have the first feast and the last feast are bookmarked by Mary. So you see the emphasis on Mary. Again, just a sampling of statements from there. She is the salvation of the word. By thy deathless dormition, thou hast sanctified the whole world. She is the salvation of the faithful and hope of our souls. The world was restored to life by her dormition. Her dormition somehow restored the whole church. The world was, uh, uh, Mary delivered her own spotless soul into the hands of her son. They're saying that she had a spotless soul. She delivered mankind from the ancestral condemnation. And then if we just continue seeing how Mary is talked about, we even see that even in Mary prayer books, they speak about Mary in such a way where when I, when you want to go to prayer, you're actually not persuaded to go to Jesus or to God, but instead to go to her because she's more merciful. So no, I got to stop you there. You're wrong. We do not teach that at all. And you're saying hymn after hymn and verse after verse that you do not understand. Now, if we could go through all of that line by line, I'd be happy to explain what we mean by it. But you clearly do not understand what you are reading. Yet, this is not, see, that's why if you, you're, you, this is, look at the whole context. Look at everything that's being said about Master, Mary. Master, I know context. I pray those very hymns every year in the church. You do not understand what you're reading. You so, it says here, I, I do not dare ask the loving God to heal my many sins and incurable wounds, but instead you're going to go to Mary so she can do it? And what about the, the odes by Theodore de Stuart that he wrote that in, that Jesus is made out to be like a person who will refuse to forgive you the don't person? Under, again, you don't understand what you're reading. When you when you take any of those, for example, if you take any of those lines about how she provided this or did that without her saying yes to Gabriel and agreeing to bear God the word, without doing that, what would God have done? But he had her. He chose her. He took her as an example of the new Eve that would not say no to his um, 
his, his commandments, but would say yes to them. And because she said yes to Gabriel and yes to God's will, she bore God the word. Therefore, bringing God the word into the world, she provided the vehicle by which salvation came into the world. So a lot of that imagery there pertains to and is lauding exactly that. Not that she brought it, but she made it possible for it to be brought into the world by bearing God the world and bringing him into this world. And calling her the mediator, capital M, calling her the mediator for the whole well, again, world? Let's look at that word in Greek because that often is a mistranslation. But again, if we look at mediator, what is often meant in the Orthodox Church by calling Mary that is there's one mediator for sins between uh, of man's sins between man and God, and that's Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ takes our sins and mediates them to the Father. But from where we are here, the saints and Mary mediate our prayers and our sins to Christ, and then he takes them to the Father. That's kind of what's being said here. There's still only one mediator for the sins of man between God and man, and that's Jesus Christ. That hasn't changed. We still confess that. And she can bring about her will? That's what's said in the hymns. She can bring about everything in her will? That sounds like God. She's not going to bring about in her will anything that her son does not want her to bring about. Look, my, my suggestion is this for anyone listening. Go read these, read them in context and see for yourself. No, there and is no context. See, and then, and you, then can't can't be, no, no. you can't be outside the church and, exp and read something and then think that you're going to have a very clear understanding of what the church has to say. There's no phony mod there. There's no orthodox mindset that helps one understand that. They don't stand on their own in that sense. They are documents, you might say, of the eternal uh, of the internal church, people that are on the inside. Mary was never taught, if you could use that word, to, to newly baptized Christian to, to catechumens until they became newly baptized Christians. Then she was talked about and explained. Her role was talked about and explained then, because then and only then, as newly baptized Christians, would Orthodox Christians have an understanding of and, and the ability to accept who and what she was. It was never part of the charisma. Never, still isn't. By the way, and and I would, with all due respect, disagree with that because to me that's a bait and switch. Come join the church. Oh no! And here's all the things we say about Mary. Here's the things that we say, and you're only going to understand it with an Orthodox pheronima. Again, it sounds like it's Gnosticism, some type of secret knowledge. Not at all. You can understand well, it. Well, no, it, it's not on, secret. Guys, because, well, no, it's not secret because people can go read it. Well, they let can me go jump. Read it now. Let but what I'm in. saying is they are not going to understand what they're reading necessarily if they are still outside the church. I'm Let not saying it's Gnostic in. or secret. I'm saying they won't fully understand it unless they have been illumined by joining themselves to the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Let me jump in real quick. And and we could keep going on this. It sounds like that's a uh, that that in and of itself should be a, a show in and of itself. And Father Jonathan, you've are you've offered and correct me if I'm wrong to come back to to explain some of those okay fair enough let's, let's do that next um but let's finish up this episode before we i i knew that was going to happen and, and bring mary but uh but i think we should definitely make mary a focus of our next discussion with you two if that would be uh, okay with you guys but uh Absolutely. all right uh, Sam, so I gave you the option to choose a question. Uh, is there a specific one that you wanted? I think we've got question seven for you and... Yeah, question, we can do question seven. Question nine. Okay, okay, we can do question seven. All right, let me get back up to it. And then we'll hit a couple audience questions, guys, and we'll be done. So that, I just want to thank our audience. Man, we... Guys, you ain't going to believe this. So be... Uh, how do I... I'm... Blah, blah. We've had the most audience uh, members stay, stay for this entire thing. 253. We have very, very little fluctuation. Uh, we're at 42 right now. And guys, you have brought the most viewers uh, that we've had since our debate with Rob Solberg and David Wilbur back in July of last year. So thank you all for that. And thank you to our listeners that have stuck around. This has been a great discussion, y'all. I'm just, I'm so thrilled to be a part of this. Uh, okay. Pastor Samuel, in your opinion, given that the literacy rate of the early church was extremely low, and according to Anthony, I might butcher this last name. Coney Harris. Coney Harris. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anthony Coney Harris, in his book, Introducing the Orthodox Church, Its Faith and Life, uh, used, quote, 
to instruct those who couldn't read, page 217 of the PDF version. Do you think the use of icons would be justifiable to help those who were illiterate understand the teachings of Jesus better? So what I would say is we need to first consider again what the Word of God says. So Romans 10, 17 says, So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. So faith comes by hearing the Word of God, not through pictures. And in fact, many icons, they're actually confusing to both the literate and illiterate. So this is just something that anyone can do. Go ahead and Google search um, the burning bush icon that's used in the Orthodox Church. You're going to see that when you do that, Mary is in the middle of the burning bush. Now, that is extremely confusing. Now, whether you're illiterate or not literate, uh, that is extremely confusing. So why does the Orthodox Church do this? They're basing this off a teaching from Gregory of Nyssa. The light of divinity did not consume the burning bush, even as the flower of her virginity was not withered by giving birth. So what you're seeing here is they're trying to push this idea of the perpetual virginity of Mary. But the problem is that that's not what we see from Scripture. We see that what Scripture shows is that what appears in the bush is the pre-incarnated Lord. And what we see here is it's actually pointing to Christ's divinity and his humanity. Christ's divinity represented in the fire and his humanity and how together it didn't consume it. So what this was doing was foreshadowing and pointing to Christ and his incarnation. But by putting Mary there, you're seeing you're taking some theological stance that you have and trying to justify it through an icon. And that is extremely problematic. Another problematic one is the icon of the visitors to Abraham. If anyone has a copy of the Orthodox Study Bible, if you look in between pages 162 to 163, you'll see this icon, and it's actually called the Holy Trinity. But the problem, again, with that is that's not what Scripture shows. I've actually spoken to Orthodox people who believe that it was the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit who appeared to Abraham as three different beings. But it actually shows, again, the pre-incarnated Lord and the two angels that would go to Sodom and Gomorrah and destroy them. So you see, again, that this is highly problematic. Now, it is true that if you have images that are biblical and are not abused by being venerated, then that's fine. And I think that we should consider a quote, for example, from Gregory the Great. Um, this is what he said. Furthermore, we notify to you that it has come to our ears that your fraternity, seeing certain adorers of images, broke and threw them, threw them down these same images in churches. And we commend you indeed for your zeal against anything made with hands being an object of adoration. That's key here. Anything made of hands being an object of adoration. But we signify to you that you ought not to have broken these images for pictorial representation is made use of in churches for this reason, that such as the ignorant of letters may at least read by looking at the walls what they cannot read in books. And it continues going on. So you see here, that the emphasis was on not abusing those images. So yes, they could be helpful, and even people like Gregory the Great saw them as a useful tool, but it was when someone was venerating them in which it was a problem there. And what he recommends to the person was what you should have done was stop the people from venerating and not necessarily destroying the image. So can images be useful? It can be, but the way that it's actually practiced, it's highly problematic. Thank you for that. Father Jonathan, any follow-up? Let's understand the practices of church going of Christians for hundreds and hundreds of years, whether at the beginning in the first, second, third century or, 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 or afterwards. And what we're not used to is discovering that people back then went to church a lot and they heard the scriptures read a lot but they heard the scriptures read in church. They heard bishops expound on the teachings of the scriptures in church. That's where they went to hear the scriptures. So yes, salvation comes from hearing and so forth, but hearing is something that is done by those to whom the proclamation of the gospel has been entrusted, primarily bishops, but also priests and deacons. Now, I'm not going to get in a discussion on bishops, priests, and deacons, but People went to church a lot, and that's where they heard the scriptures. And the icons, if they existed and how much they existed, again, we earlier said we don't know, simply backed up that story. And they were, over time, took on certain form and schema that was able to explain the whole story 
uh, often in a nonlinear way. That, that's happening when you look at the icon of Christmas, for example. But the, that whole icon, for example, of Christmas can tell the whole story from St. Luke. And um, people could make the correlation because they were very familiar with the scriptures they heard in church. And um, it wasn't unusual, for example, for monks by the third century that would go to monasteries and have to be able to repeat the entire Psalter, all 150 Psalms, in order to get in and join the, the brotherhood, in, in order to join the monastery. People's knowledge of scripture was very different uh, than it is today. Of course, they heard it in, for the most part, Greek. They spoke Greek, prayed in Greek, heard the scriptures in Greek, et cetera, et cetera, worshiped in Greek. Um, their experience of church and how they interacted with the proclamation of the gospel was very different than what we have today. You know, the, the hymns of the worship services were the Psalms. Uh, um, there was very little that was man-made. So people back then were, uh, you know, imbued in an ethos of scripture in the worship services of the church. But let's all keep in mind that to, to have a, uh, a gospel, uh, even one gospel, even a, a, an epistle of Paul, you had to copy that. And most people, you know, if they were illiterate, they had to hire someone to do it. And that wasn't in the average home budget. But neither was iconography at the time. So when people heard the gospel, they heard it in church. When they saw the gospel in color, in iconography, they saw it in church. One is not a substitute for the other, but they can go hand in hand and work together symbiotically very beautifully. All right. Thank you for that. All right, guys. So this, again, I can't reiterate enough. This has been a really good, a really passionate and a really, I think, pedagogical in the sense of, you know, I, I've learned a lot from both sides, and it's definitely gave me a lot to think about. So three hours worth of content is uh, that's a lot to go through. So I am going to not only encourage myself, but for our panel and for our listeners to go back, re-listen to this over and over again, uh, because I think we'll all miss something if we just listen to it one time through. There's a lot of good stuff offered on both sides of the debate uh, tonight. But I want to give the floor uh, to my host, to my co-host tonight. Um, before we get into the audience questions, uh, they've been super quiet, super patient. I want to start with Dale. Is there anything that you want to add, maybe a question uh, for either Father Jonathan or uh, Pastor Sam before we get into this? Let's let's kind of keep it short where we are at the three-hour mark, um, and then we'll jump into the audience questions, and then uh, we'll see Father Jonathan and Pastor Sam rap battle each other next time on Faith and Altar. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, just ahead, no. just to save time, I, I'll ask an audience question type deal. So okay, yeah, I see that ahead. you've kind of started a few here. So I have. Yeah. All right. So here's one from Night Resplendent. The canon of Scripture is also a later development. So are we to just throw that out and become? uh originists or ebionites and then just follow only the tanakh i'm i'm guessing that's for pastor uh pastor sam to yeah start that was from much earlier in the convo but yeah oh did you guys already ask this okay no so. no we haven't asked this what he's no. what he's getting at is something that sam said uh early in the discussion so okay cool yeah yeah i don't see the the, the canon of scripture being a, a later development what we see is that one scripture uh, comes out, it is scripture, and we even see scripture that uh, looks at other scripture, like with Peter looking at Paul saying that this is scripture. So God's word has always been God's word since the second the the author was writing the autograph, the original writing. It was always scripture. So this is not some type of later development that was made by the tradition of men that came about hundreds of years later on. That's absolutely completely different. Uh, for for us to say, oh well, well it was the church who put together the scriptures. That's also not accurate at all. I mean, for me to go and 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 identify a robin, it does not mean that I have created a robin or that I provided it. God created it. Just the fact that I can identify it doesn't mean that I have some type of authority there. So no, I don't see the 
that the canon of scripture being any type of later development. Okay. And did do we want uh, the father to respond or just the person that it's directed to? I definitely want to give uh, both uh, a chance okay. to respond to these questions. So, yeah, go ahead, Father Jonathan. The canon of scripture is definitely a later development. There isn't a, a, a Protestant uh, uh, a scholar worth his weight who denies that nowadays, period. Mike Kruger. <laughs> Do you have anything you want to add to that, David? Like, I was like, well, he said not one, one scholar. No, Mike Kruger, I mean, he's a, he's a, a canon specialist, and he does deny that. But I was just pointing that out. Okay. I think that's where Sam got his Robin uh, <laughs> reference from. <laughs> but anyways. Uh, All right. Yeah. I think there might have been a minor misapprehension of the, the question also, is mm -hmm. that it was talking about uh, the canonicity of Scripture, not the in, not the inspiration of Scripture. Those Scriptures that are accepted as canon were always Scripture, but they were declared as the canon of Scripture later on. I think that's what the question is. Yeah, Council was. of Trent. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's a, thing. <laughs> a group to get, that came together and identified something that it is what it is, um, that... I mean, it's it has always been scripture. So so it, it, it was scriptures from the moment that it was written, and it was easily identifiable. And that's why these other apocryphal books were so clearly not scripture, because it's so clear to see what is scripture and what isn't scripture. I, well, it wasn't clear to the various church fathers and other people who quoted from them back then. We see the assumption of Moses quoted in the epistle to Jude. We see the book of Enoch and other uh, letters and so forth. I, I think we have to keep in mind that back in the sec Second Temple period and, and certainly afterwards, of course, there was a lot of stuff floating around called Scripture. Mm -hmm. um, the, the fact that even in the New Testament, it's made very clear that the Sadducees only read from the five books of Moses and the Pharisees read from the prophets, which the Sadducees didn't do shows that there was a big difference um, uh, in what was considered scripture during Second Temple. And you even have the, the other groups like the Essenes who had their own writings that were scripture to them, but not to the others. And then even in the early Christian community, you have the Epistle of Barnabas, you have the Shepherd of Hermas, you've got all of these other books floating around, quoted and treated as part of what was the emerging New Testament canon from the very beginning. So to say that it was set from the very beginning would not be um, uh, correct, because the, the very context of history and the historical development of the canon and how we see it developing in, in church father after church father is very clear. I just to kind of throw my weight or my input in on this, uh, and we did this in a previous episode, so I'm not bringing anything new to the table that we haven't brought. Uh, anyone right now can go to BibleCanon.org and look at all of the canon lists that have been uh, found and discovered throughout uh, history. Yeah. And what's interesting, what I found very interesting, is that out of the first 17 of that list, none of them agree with each other. Um, mm -hmm. They're all different. And yeah. and the only one that agrees with the Protestant canon is the earliest one. It's Briani's list. And so after that, they all differ. And so that's just kind of, you know, anyone can look at that, BibleCanon.org. Uh, uh, yeah, we also have to uh, consider context, too, in this aspect, too, because there was a... a a departure from the Jews as well. Um, you know, many of our early church fathers didn't know Hebrew. Uh, I think Origen and Jerome were the only ones. But uh, to that point, I would say check out it, it, instead of getting into a canon debate <laughs> on top of of, uh, of icons. Let's look. Uh, go to some resources. There's canon revisited. There's question of canon. Uh, the question of uh, orthodoxy. Uh, uh, by Mike Kruger, and on the other side, uh, you have uh, oh man, Law, right? Is that his name, right? When God Tyler? spoke Greek by Michael. When God Law. spoke Greek, yeah. When God spoke Greek by Michael Law. Uh, just check those out, compare them, and contrast. That's the book that started this whole debate <laughs> with with faith unaltered, anyway. But anyway, okay. Uh, let's see, Josh Davidson, you've been awful. Well, you've been, you've you've interacted a little bit. Uh, any closing? Uh, remarks one question um or, or any just closing uh, thoughts i can say that this this conversation has illuminated to me why I, I am still let's say um i i'm still submerged in the residue of my protestantism but i'm very enticed and 
let's say, edified by learning about the Eastern Church. And this conversation for me has been a really interesting display of how torn I still feel about these subjects, because I definitely understand where Sam's coming from. But I feel like I understand the the abrupt uh, kind of responses that that uh, Father Jonathan is giving to say, no, 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 not this, but this. Uh, and And so I can see that tension. I feel like I'm standing on both sides of the line that divides this disagreement. And it's a very odd kind of uncomfortable place to be. And I feel like I can say I understand without being yet able to say like I agree with either side in a holistic sense. And so this has been a really <coughs> um, useful time for me specifically. So if nobody else gets that added benefit, uh, God blessed me for sure by participating in this conversation, but I've been trying to listen mm -hmm. very carefully to the things that you guys are saying, um, and, and not jump in unnecessarily, uh, as, as we all have been trying to listen very carefully. Um, but I'm, I'm noticing that a lot of, uh, a lot of the, the back and forth starts as a generalization and then gets more and more particular. And what I really like about that is that this is a breeding ground for more great conversations. And I feel like this is going to mark, uh, let's say, a, 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 like these kind of conversations mark a transitional time in Christian apologetics. And those kind of conversations that we have in the future will be the references of conversations like this. And so I, I feel really privileged to be a part of this. And I thank you both very much. That needs to be a t-shirt of Faith Unaltered. We're the breeding ground of good conversation. <laughs> anyway. All right. Uh, David, what's up, brother? Oh, man. I mean, you guys have done splendid. I uh, uh, praise you both for coming on, and I, I thank you for coming on. I don't really have an ending question for either of you. You guys have both tackled the, the conversation uh, vehemently and beautifully. And I think you've brought a lot to the table for people to consider. I think God has been glorified in this conversation, but because I believe that, uh, uh, you know, there's unity and diversity and Christianity is not about uniformity, but unity. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much where I'll end. All right, brother. Thank you. And I just, again, just to reiterate what David said, I praise you both and, and, if it's not uh, too too big of a of a big deal, I want to uh, just honor you both in in that saying, you are more both of you guys more than welcome back uh, anytime, any place. Just let me know a date that you guys want to talk about Mary, and we will make that happen. Uh, but no, I love you both uh, very very much, and, um, and and just thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, for agreeing to come on. Uh, like I said, it's been it's been passionate which we all, I think we all can respect that, you know, that fact that this is a passionate conversation between, I think people, two people that love the Lord with all their heart and, and, and want in and, and is seeking truth, uh, like we all are. And so for that, um, just to say that I've, like I said, I really like this conversation. I love the way it's gone. I think it shows with our audience, uh, participation in the comments as well. And so let's go ahead and Without further ado, not to keep them waiting any longer, um, answer some of their questions. So let, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna randomly pick here. Uh, so the vulture he asks question uh, for Father Jonathan: Do you believe that all believers will go to heaven, Orthodox or not? Not my call. That belong that decision belongs to the Father, and I cannot give you anything other than an opinion, which I will not do. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, Sam, any follow-up for that? Like I said, I want to give you both a chance to answer these. Well, if we're looking at the, the gospel, and I would say the gospel that I see that's from Scripture, um, you can, you, you'll can you find Orthodox and Catholics who don't hold to some of these ideas, um, and maybe they would be considered a bad Orthodox or a bad Catholic, but they truly believe in the Lord, and they surrender their lives to Him. Yes, they we will see them in heaven. And because that's what the gospel message is. So I can't say, oh, you know, um, only Baptists are going to make it. Only Reformed people are going to make it or, or so forth. If you truly believe in him with all your heart, then you are born again. And that, that's even a, a same truth that's in the Orthodox and the Catholics for those who truly believe. But those who are, you know, engaging in idolatry or they hold the church that, self that they hold to and they put that truly above God, 
to know that they're, they're not actually worshiping God. But no, I do believe that when we look at heaven, we're going to see people um, who are true believers, even in the Orthodox and the Catholic. Okay. Thank you guys both for that. Uh, let me hide that question for Sam and I'll wait till it pops up. If worship is sacrifice, how can veneration of saints be of concern to you? What's the distinction between venerating saints and your own family members? So when, when I love my family members, I am not giving them qualities that are only for God alone to them. So for example, I have a loved one who, who passed away and I know that they were, you could see that they were a believer. So you, you know, you're going to see them again one day. I'm not going ahead and trying to communicate to them or, or to do things um, that are only qualities for God. So, you know, there's a big distinction between loving somebody um, and, and how saints are treated. And the idea that uh, about worship being sacrifice, uh, the key thing here is that when one is displaying worship, it's really what is what is occupying your mind? What is what is the thing that concerns you? What are you living your life by? If you look at um, John, when he writes his epistle in First John, he ends it off when he, he warns uh, the people that he's been writing to to flee from idolatry. And it almost seems like a random statement at the very end of his epistle. But what he's telling them is if, if you hold on to these false ideas um, from these people who are teaching a false gospel, that's become an idol for you. So flee from that. That includes icons and all these other things. So, no, there's a huge difference between how one honors a family member and what's being practiced as veneration in the Orthodox Church. Father Jonathan, any follow-up? No. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Do, do, do. Brian Jeffries asks, at Faith Unaltered, can we ask why Hezekiah destroyed the bronze snake Excuse me. From numbers, after it was being worshipped, I think that question's already uh, been answered. Yeah, I think that was answered. Yeah, uh, the answer is, and I, Sam, I think, or well, maybe both you guys uh, discussed it a bit uh, because it was being worshipped, it was being abused, and that's why Hezekiah destroyed it. So we'll hide that one. All right, uh, the last two questions are from the same person. So uh, Lazarus Connolly. Can anyone guess who his patron saint is? <laughs> My question uh, to both, but specifically, uh, the Jews venerated the graves of their saints and still do, as do Christians. Is this idolatry to Pastor Sam? So, Sam, I think that's for you. Um, yeah, if, if, if veneration is used by simply going to the gravesite, remembering the person, that, that's not the veneration that's being warned against. That's, that's idolatry with an icon. It's a completely different practice. So that, that's one of the things that we need to distinguish. Um, respecting somebody, honoring somebody is not the same thing as going to something and kissing it and touching it and offering prayers <laughs> and thinking that through it, it's going to be a window to the actual person. Those are two completely different actions. So no, um, a person who honors somebody or even goes to the gravesite to remember that person is not engaging in idolatry. Father Jonathan? No, the question was addressed to Pastor Sam. Okay. All right. And the last one uh, question. Are we making an idol of the Old Testament and New Testament saints since the Bible itself is a crafted item and basically an icon in and of itself that tells us these holy men and women and holy men and women's stories? Hmm. So I'll let... Um, Father Jonathan, if you want to. Well, I don't know of any more. Christian that makes an idol of the OT or, or NT and, and, and how that would play out. Um, some things here, since the Bible itself is a crafted item, I think I know what he means by that, and I probably would agree. Um, whether it's an icon in and of itself, um, yeah, th this, this question needs a lot of unpacking. I don't know that we have the time now to do it. Okay, no, fair enough. Um, Pastor Sam? You know, I don't see the scripture as being an icon or or we're worshiping the, the, the New Testament or the Old Testament. I just see that we are seeing what God's word is saying and we're, we're basing our lives based on that. But no, I don't see that as idolatry. Okay, all right. I would probably agree with that, by the way. Nice. Hey, you we know what? end off agreeing. I think that is a good place <laughs> uh, to end, actually. And so... 
guys um let's do one more round uh well actually let me let me do this first um if people do you guys have uh, any you know uh books or any place that people can listen uh or if you want to or if they want to visit your churches i know you both are uh well pastor and a priest of a church where can people find you um and we'll start with pastor sam so um, I'm a missionary with Village Mission. So if you go on their website and you go to different churches that serve there and you look up Bethel Baptist Church, or if you just Google it, it's in Gorham, New York. Um, that's a church that I'm serving in. Um, and if you Google on YouTube, all the sermons are up there. Um, and if you look at Expositing the Word, that contains all the um, sermons that I've preached, articles I've written. Um, so you can go there if you want to have um, uh, some of that content. And I'm, a, I'm on Facebook, so please feel free to reach out any questions or anything. Um, love to chat. That's where I found you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Father Jonathan. The same thing. If people want to email me, there's my email. I'm on Facebook. Feel free to friend me. My uh, uh, my church has a, a St. John the Theologian Orthodox Church uh, has a, a, a Facebook page. And the our website, uh, St. John ST, St. John the Theologian.com, um, has all my previous. Um, uh, apologetics videos, which which address some of these other questions that have come up today. Okay, and for those of our audience that didn't see it, so uh, Father Jonathan put his email where his name is. So in the bottom, uh, for y'all, I think it's the uh, left hand corner of the screen. Uh, for me, it's the right. So, yep, in that little black box there uh, is Father Jonathan's email. All right, David, Dale, yeah, Josh, um, closing remarks. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, just don't drink cream soda with a <laughs> label of crush on it. It is not real. It is a Canadian fake. Um, but no, uh, <laughs> no, honestly, you know, uh, um, I want to say happy birthday to Dale. His birthday was yeah. on the 19th. Happy birthday, bro. And I have been so blessed to have Dale join us and add to the conversation and our friendship has just grown over the last couple of years and it started from a measly conversation about hell and uh, wow. <laughs> uh, it's I, grown. I, and I'd and love I'm you to just, tell Chris date that our conversation about hell was just measly. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I would reframe, you know, Chris is my boy too. I like him. <laughs> um, but I do got to say, it's been wonderful and happy birthday, brother. I am glad you're now an old man. Now we can uh, share in the back pains and the struggles. No, <laughs> but uh, honestly, guys, no, it, this has been a, a great conversation, too. Like I said, um, you know, I would just refer everybody to the earlier conversation so we don't have to regurgitate uh, since we're already at three hours and 21 minutes. This has been a long one. Uh, you know, what's coming next? Uh, there's going to be more interfaith dialogue. Uh, we're going to also keep this as instead of just focusing inwardly as Christians, we want to reach the culture as well. So we're going to be doing still our debates, uh, um, um, our debates with atheists and stuff like that. We're still going to be participating in that. So um, it's a big focus. We want to get the conversations out there, whether it's belief in the existence of God or whether it's Christians trying to figure out, uh, you know, the many things that have gone on in the past 2000 years, so to yeah. speak. Right. So um, faith unaltered is a place for these conversations. And uh, we try to, you know, make a atmosphere where people can come in dialogue and not feel uh, judged, persecuted, but rather honored and respected for their points of view. Even if we disagree, we can disagree without being disagreeable. Um, and just remember, in the ultimate sense, people don't care how much you know, but want to know how much you care. So uh, keep that in mind as you evangelize, and I'll hand it over to my other co-host. Yeah, and, and just to kind of piggyback on what David was saying, you know, there are multiple ways uh, to get our content out there, not just financial donations or anything like that. If you'd like to do that, email me, Faith Unaltered at gmail.com or like i said you can give us a super chat or a super sticker any any anything helps and we put it toward this ministry but if you like this content y'all it's super easy and free give us a thumbs up comment like y'all have been the comment section has been crazy um and share this video share this video with your friends with your family 
uh, with acquaintances, anybody you meet that is interested in this subject uh, specifically or in a host of our other subjects uh, that we have uh, posted. We've got over 200 videos on our YouTube channel. We have a separate TikTok with exclusive content on there. And we have Facebook that David and I post regularly at. So, so, you know, we're out there on social media. People just need to know about us. And that's where you come in. Share our content with as many people as you can and, and get the word out because we rely on our listeners to do that very thing. Um, that's not my closing statements, but just to piggyback on what David said. But Josh, I'll hand it over to you, then Dale, and then I will take us out. Oh, man. So I guess uh, in let's say in, in to, to round off the end of the, the, the episode in closing, I would say that this again, this conversation has been really remarkable and I can't wait to have more of it. I hope it has the kind of impact that I think it merits having. Uh, and I think that it is a marvel to me how consistent our viewers have been this entire stream. This was really cool. Uh, I feel like this is a, a turning point even perhaps for the channel. Um, but I, I'm, I'm, I, I just wanted to reiterate perhaps uh, in my closing statements as to why if somebody's listening to this and wondering, well, they're, they're Christians, they both, you know, believe in this Jesus. Why are they disagreeing this way? And why are they doing it so strongly? The passion that's coming out in this conversation is a sign of the seriousness that's being taken over the fact that we really believe what we're saying here. So if this just sounds weird to you, take that into, into account here, is that we really believe that Christ is alive. We really believe in that empty tomb. We really believe in the crucifixion. We really believe in one God, one faith, and one baptism. We really believe these things. And we really believe that unity is a goal that can be that can be desired and and even achieved in most cases if we would come and reason together. And so this is a really great way to do that uh, and a great way to open the door for other people to do that. And I hope we've modeled uh, the, the desire for clarity with charity because I think that's ultimately the, the baseline uh, goal of what we're trying to achieve with these kind of discussions. And I feel like you guys have uh, you know, even including the, the passionate responses and the back and forth and the strong disagreement that you guys have done really well at uh, at keeping your countenance steady and not being, uh, you know, too too polemical or, uh, you know, using any kind of ad hominem or, or insults or, or, you know, cross language or anything like that. It's been really, really great. And uh, I'm so thankful that both of you have given your time and attention to this subject and to one another, that this conversation be made possible. And I'm so glad that everybody who's listening is still enjoying themselves. This has been a really great time. I'm super thankful. Dale, you got the floor. All right. Awesome. Yeah. So I won't take, take too long because I, I know it's about three and a half hours now. So just out of respect for everyone. Um, yeah. Just say thank you, David, for the, the birthday wishes. I, I am feeling old. I, I had to leave. My back is actually killing me because I've been here since 11 a.m. sitting in this position. So I had to go and lie down a bit during the show. But uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you to the guests. I, I didn't hear everything uh, yet, but the parts that I did hear were interesting and, and I want to learn more and that sort of thing. So I'm going to be going over this this debate tomorrow. And uh, from what I've heard, it it sounds like I'm going to learn a lot from you guys. So thank you guys for, for coming on and having your having your debate and giving your opinions on this topic. So there you go. Right on, Short and Bill. sweet. Just, just the way we like it in our three-hour <laughs> conversations. <laughs> yeah, I don't have the all the words like you guys, all the the flattery and stuff like that. I mean, we just repeat ourselves, bro. So it's fine. <laughs> no, but thank you for that, Dale, and happy birthday, brother. Is it, this is it, it's good to have you here with us, man. And so bless your your next year. Um, so yeah, uh, guys, uh, man, so much to say, and I want to be respectful of people's times. Uh, I I do want to make a quick announcement. Uh, we do have an episode tomorrow that we are doing at 11.30 a.m. Uh, on theodicy. So for those who don't know what that is, God and the problem of evil. If evil exists, why does a good God allow it? We're going to be giving our reasons uh, for why uh, we think the scripture teaches what it does teach about theodicy and evil and suffering in, in the church fathers. It's going to be a good episode. So join us tomorrow at 11.30 for that. 
Um, y'all, so this is really the the whole conversation of orthodoxy is very near and dear to my heart for one reason and one reason alone, well, many reasons, but one primary reason that sticks out to me in the front of my mind is because this Sunday, uh, April the 23rd, I will be a catechumen in uh, the Antiochian Orthodox Church um, a, at my local parish. Uh, so I talked to uh, the priest there, we've been going there, uh, my wife and my little girl and myself have been going there for the last mm, two months, uh, two and a half months, and we really enjoy ourselves. Uh, we, I've loved what I've learned just taking the two months to study uh, orthodoxy, and you know, I, I can't wait to take this full year. Uh, the the catechumenship at, at Arch uh, Parish is a year, and so I get to take this year to get to study orthodox theology um, not only in the orthodoxy 101 classes uh, at the parish but also in my free time and here's the thing i not only is is my my life impacted by this i have a wife and i have a little girl and i take very very serious what these two gentlemen have laid out on the table tonight uh because here's the thing if this is, and I and I have prayed, y'all, I have prayed so much uh, in the past couple of months that if there is just something horribly wrong with orthodoxy, that God would make it known, uh, that I want the truth. And I've said it multiple times on this channel. I've said it multiple times on our old channel. And I, I will continue to say it, that at the end of the day, I don't care what I call myself. I don't care what label I have. All I care about, because if all that stuff falls away, I still have Jesus. And I don't care what I call myself. I just want to be a seeker of the truth, a real seeker, as Dale calls it. Um, and, and, I, and I want truth, man, because I believe that truth is objective, and I believe Jesus is the truth, and he lays that out for us. I believe the apostles taught the truth, and therefore I want to be, I want to consume that. And I want that for my wife, and I want that for my little girl. No, like I just said, my life isn't only impacted by this. If I'm leading my children or my child and my wife into idolatry, I want to know that. Um, and so if, if I'm not, and if I'm leading them in the way that God wants us uh, all to go eventually, I want to know that too. And so I thank you both. And, and, and I, I really, I really do because you've both laid out the case and now it's my job as not only a real seeker myself, but as a mini shepherd, I'll say for my wife and my little girl, um, to, to really engage with and to participate in with. And so this is how much this means to me. And I just wanted to be real and open my heart to you guys, uh, to let you know where I'm coming from. So I take very, very serious what you both have said tonight. Um, and I cannot wait uh, to get you back on to discuss all these other concepts whenever it comes to orthodoxy. And so thank you both so much, um, Pastor Sam, Father Jonathan. This has been an absolute pleasure, and so I can't wait to study it. With that, I will say what I always say at the end of every episode. <coughs> David, get the video ready. Good night. God bless. And ladies and gentlemen, please, please, please stay like Christ.